Welcome everyone to day two of Adobe Ditto World 2023. I'm Matt Sullivan of Techcom Tools, and just like yesterday's Ditto World sessions, I'll be your co-host along with Stefan Gens, Adobe's evangelist for the technical communication suite of products. If you missed yesterday's event, be sure to watch the recordings when they're available. They're full of information that will help you and your organization make the most out of your content. Yesterday, we started the day with back-to-back -back sessions from Adobe's Vivek Kumar and Scriptorium's Sarah O'Keefe, and they showed us how, as technical communication professionals, AI will, and already is, impacting us and our profession. After that, we also heard about Ernst & Young's great success in managing the awesome amount of content required in the financial services sector. We followed up the EY session with what might have been the most entertaining session of the day, and that was an interaction between Sebastian Fuhrer, the Director of Content Engineering for the Mayo Clinic, and Bernard Eschwanden, EVP of Business Development at Precision Content. Chad Dibdahl, Senior Solution Consultant at Acrolynx and former Adobe Solution Consultant, gave us a midday keynote and wrapped up AEM guides, generative AI, and content governance to give us a full picture of where we might be going to create better content as we move forward. But for me, the can't miss session was from Adobe's Divrav Singh, who showed us what's coming soon in AEM guides in terms of predictive structured content creation and real-time suggestions for content reuse. Divrav showed us how AEM will use machine learning to guide you in creation of effective, reusable content pulling from your existing library of work. And if you were here, you know that we rounded out the day with really great sessions on how content management systems continue to grow more closely connected. Dilip K, the group product manager for AEM Guides, and Vinod Gupta, a senior engineer at Adobe, showed us the impressive number of connections that can be made between Jira and many PLM, PIM systems and databases. And we wrapped with a deep discussion of specializing DITA from Marcus Wiedemeyer, showing you that the better you know your content needs, the easier it is to fine tune the DITA content model to meet your exact specifications. And today is every bit as packed as yesterday. We start today with Saibal Bhattacharji, Marketing Director for Adobe's Learning and Publishing Business Unit. Saibal's welcome note will show you how to use quantitative and qualitative business metrics to demonstrate the ROI of technical content for customers from pre-sale all the way through to post-sale. And yesterday, we had a fantastic customer story on the Mayo Clinic from Precision Content's Bernard Eschwanden. Our morning keynote is from Rob Hanna, president of Precision Content, and he'll discuss how DITA, AEM guides, and generative AI will intersect to improve creation, management, and delivery of content. We've got Hannah Heinenen and Christian Forsman from the Cone Corporation. They'll be pulling back the curtain and showing us the best practices employed by Cone's global technical documentation teams. You'll see the diverse outputs that they generate from their content, illuminating the capabilities and requirements of their delivery platforms. We've also got Amanda Patterson and her story from Hunter Douglas USA. She'll share her own content migration journey, discussing the things you might consider taking on yourself in a content conversion, and when perhaps the best thing to do is to call a professional. And another customer success story comes from Susanna Carlisi, lead content strategist for global product documentation at Siena. Susanna dives into the details of Siena's DITA authoring and shares when and why Siena uses both AEM Guide's web UI and Adobe FrameMaker to edit their DITA content. After these two great customer stories, Adobe's own Vishep Gupta will then show us how AEM Guide's 
and experience fragments combine to help you to create superb output with AEM sites. And we're not done yet. Our afternoon partner session is a return trip from Bernard Eschwanden of Precision Content. Bernard will show you how to use AEM guides to work less and do more. He'll show you his best tips and tricks on content creation, migration, and publishing, and behind the scenes ways to make the editor do what you want with features that Adobe provides right out of the box. If, of course, Adobe Experience Manager came in a box. And then, for our final session of the day, we'll hear from Ulrich Parson, CEO at Parson AG Germany. Ulrich will discuss smart factories and the industrial IoT, or Internet of Things. She'll show how intelligent content is critically important in all aspects of planning, manufacturing, and maintenance even in a traditional industry or factory. There's a lot in today's sessions, so along the way, Stefan and I will do our best to provide you with time for questions and answers, and the occasional break to let you move around just a bit. Just like yesterday, the chat panel is sure to be clicking along, but if you're looking for a more detailed answer for your questions or your queries, consider posting in the questions panel. That will let our presenters provide a more threaded response to your query. Thanks for sticking with me through this overview, and now it's time for the real stars of the show, starting with Seibel. Stefan and I hope you are excited as we are for today's content. He did make me promise to make this intro a bit longer, but I suspect you guys are all ready to get started. Hello everyone and welcome to day two of Adobe Data World 2023. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us today. Can't believe it's already the eighth edition of Adobe Data World. Thank you so much for your support for all these years. My name is Saibal Bhattacharji. I am a director of marketing at Adobe and I've been associated with the technical communication business for more than 13 years now. Uh, before I start talking about the topic, uh, business impact of technical content, the ROI paradox. Uh, I quickly wanted to capture some of the key takeaways from day one of Adobe Data World 2023. Uh, some of the insights that Vivek Kumar uh, in his welcome note and Sarah O'Keefe in her opening keynote on day one uh, shared around the impact that generative AI, chat GPT is already having on content development. Um, I, I found it really interesting uh, to hear their thoughts on where AI will have maximum impact in the content operations, uh, the role of AI specifically in high stake content and some of their great ideas on how to get started with AI in, in content operations. Uh, there was a session, a customer presentation by Mayo Clinic, which I really enjoyed. Uh, and it was really amazing to see the great work they are doing with medical content by making it personalized at scale, uh, by making it channel agnostic, by making it well annotated, uh, by making it persona oriented. So that was a great, great session for me. Uh, I would also, I also really enjoyed the session by Devraj Singh from Adobe, where he showed some sneak peeks into some of the innovations that we are bringing, AI driven innovations that we are bringing to AEM guides, Adobe CCMS in the coming days. Really excited to bring those innovations to all of you. Uh, in the near future. My topic today will focus on the age old perception that technical documentation is a cost 
and technical documentation department is a cost center. Um, now, traditionally, we have seen organizations do a good job in calculating and monitoring the costs associated with creating, managing, and delivering technical content. And it's easy for them to do it because uh, they can define matrix around people, how many content writers do you have in your team, how much time reviewers and SMEs are spending on the content, uh, matrix around processes, uh, the review and approval time, the translation costs, and also technology. Uh, how much does it cost you annually uh, to purchase, install, and maintain your authoring tools, publishing tools, your CCMS, your digital asset management system, your web content management system, and the likes. However, when you move to the other end of the spectrum, uh, we have seen organizations struggle to objectively measure and quantify the financial and non-financial gains and savings derived from technical content. And based on our conversations with executives in global organizations who run tech, technical publishing departments, we have seen it boils down to a couple of themes. Lack of measurable business metrics, and the lack of sophisticated frameworks or models for impact attribution. And even in a recent Adobe study that we did with 40 companies spread over North America and Europe, 95% of the organizations came back and said they were struggling to scientifically measure the ROI of technical content due to the lack of clearly attributable and measurable metrics. But should that be so difficult to define, track, and measure attributable metrics which capture the value of technical content at different stages of the customer life cycle in today's day and age? Uh, the Adobe point of view is very clear. Technical content, we believe, plays a very, very important role at every stage of the customer journey, not just post-sale where it's obvious, but also pre-sale. Throughout awareness, consideration, purchase, retention, advocacy. And a recent Forrester study establishes this fact by calling out that 74% of B2B buyers actually evaluate technical documentation critically as a part of their purchase decision making process. So let's quickly look at what could be some of these metrics that we should be looking at capturing at the different stages of the customer journey, which in turn will help us quantitatively justify the value and impact of technical content. Let's take the awareness phase. Um, and let's take a typical documentation website or a knowledge base portal where a lot of traffic is coming. Uh, if you are set up uh, with a hosting and content delivery platform, which is integrated to an advanced web analytics system that allows you to bifurcate and differentiate the traffic into traffic coming from customer organizations versus prospect organizations. There's a lot that you can do in terms of building and reporting some solid business matrix. Some soft matrix could be improved SEO performance. Uh, when prospects are researching products and services, how high in organic rank does your documentation website appear, your knowledge base portal appear. Uh, increase in organic traffic to your documentation website from prospect organizations. Improvement in positive sentiment score uh, of end user comments, provided you, you have enabled end user commenting and you're capturing uh, uh, and you're doing sentiment analysis on the comments shared 
uh, by end users. Let's move to the consideration phase. Again, uh, as long as you have a documentation website or knowledge base portal uh, where you are clearly able to differentiate prospect traffic, it's actually easy for you to go and report increase in inbound sales leads, which are directly attributable to traffic to the trials page, which is coming from the documentation portal. Uh, also, going another step forward, increase in the lead to opportunity conversion rate for those leads, which again are generating from traffic originating in the documentation portal. Let's move to the post purchase implementation phase. And there are some hard metrics here that we can capture and report back to the business. Reduction in go lifetime, reduction in implementation costs, reduction in volume of installation or configuration issues faced during go live phase. Also reduction in end user training time and cost, which means end users are able to leverage your technical documentation, your e-learning videos better to ramp up on the product or service. Now let's move to the actual usage phase and uh, I've broken it up into two parts, value realization. Uh, let's call usage phase one as value realization. And this is where typically end users are deriving daily value uh, from the products or services. There's ongoing maintenance involved. There's on-demand fixing of issues, troubleshooting of uh, um, issues. So if you look at the matrix that we can capture from customer support or field service technicians and their operations, these are hard matrix to report back. Reduction in inbound support calls or cases. Reduction in turnaround time for support agents to resolve issues. Many other re reduction in increase in first time resolution of issues. Decrease in uh, escalation of uh, customer support issues. And then if you move on, look at the other side, uh, there's some soft matrix as well that we can capture and report. Reduction in time spent by customers, external customers, as well as internal employees in searching through content to arrive at the right answers quickly. Similarly, moving on to the usage phase two, where the customers are still using the products uh, and, and now we have moved to the retention and advocacy part of it. Again, hard matrix which make your customers more productive increase in system uptime faster completion of scheduled maintenance works and some soft matrix which capture how loyal your customers are becoming increase in product feature adoption which can be attributed to better documentation quality improvement in customer satisfaction score reduction in churn rate increase in customer renewal rates, faster renewal cycles. These are matrix that can be captured and attributed back to technical documentation. And I want to leave you with one thought. Um, as advancements in technologies like web analytics, content analytics, customer journey analytics uh, lead to better data tracking, and more sophisticated data attribution models, we are actually seeing the emergence of very interesting and innovative composite matrix that captured the business impact of technical content more meaningfully and accurately. And I'm gonna just give you a couple of uh, rudimentary examples uh, just to help you understand what I mean by composite matrix. Uh, look at the example, uh, at the bottom on the right hand side. Uh, this is a composite matrix where we are combining different matrix, assigning weightages to them, different weightages to them based on business importance of those individual, individual factors uh, and reporting a, com a composite matrix. 
So that's a very, very interesting area that we are already seeing emerging. I want you to take this back with you. And when you go back to your work, think about some of the matrix that you in your organization can accurately define, capture, and track, and report back. Uh, finally, uh, we have a great rest of the event lined up, day two and day three, uh, as I am especially looking forward to uh, a couple of customer presentations today from Kony and Siena, where they're going to talk about uh, how they're revolutionizing the editorial process and content personalization process uh, uh, in their own fields. Uh, I'm also very keenly awaiting the session by Vishab Gupta from Adobe, where he will demonstrate live uh, how you can create exceptional customer experiences by leveraging data content in AEM guides and experience fragments in AEM sites, which is Adobe's web CMS system. Uh, and immediately after my uh, note, uh, Rob Hanna from Precision Content will take center stage with his opening keynote for day two. And I'm really looking forward to his insights into how, uh, uh, how transformative a role uh, generative AI will play across the content supply chain. And I hope Rob's session and the other sessions to follow today and tomorrow will inspire us when we go back to our, our work to design and deliver exceptional customer experiences. Thank you so much for uh, your time and enjoy the rest of the conference. Hello, and welcome to day two of Adobe Data World 2023. I'm very pleased to be uh, giving your uh, opening keynote address uh, today. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, about structured content horizons and mapping the future. So uh, I'm uh, Rob Han. I am the principal and founder of Precision Content in Toronto. Uh, and I've been at this for uh, quite some time as a technical writer and information architect, and now a uh, business owner and entrepreneur. I've been in this business now for going on 30 years. And for 10 of those last years, um, I've been assembling a team of uh, expert uh, writers, architects, trainers, developers, project managers, such that we can help to uh, serve uh, medium and large enterprises as they go through their journey of uh, digital transformation, um, helping to um, assist them in uh, building better uh, information solutions, more robust um, content operations, and uh, uh, better effect for uh, their users, their staff, and their partners. So today, uh, we're going to be talking quite a bit about emerging technology that uh, has a lot of us uh, interested in wanting to understand where it is and where we're going from here. And of course, that's generative AI, um, chat GPT, uh, and the like. And what impact is it going to have on our profession as technical communicators, as trainers, as Marcom writers, and the like? Um, where, where are we going with it? And you know, to that end, um, looking at how we prepare for it or how we continue uh, to evolve or prepare for it. And really, it comes down to, well, it's, it's in our name, uh, precision, precision content. And not just precision in the technology or even the models, but even in the way we write that content. Right, so how do we rise to the challenge 
to help transform your content to make it better ready for emerging technologies. And really, this is all about serving the new enterprise, the exponential organization whose mission it is to disrupt their own industries, right? And this, this is done through information enablement by making information readily available, not just to customers or even partners, but to staff and people within your organization that need to have access to the best information possible about your products and services. And to this end, uh, I've, I've been following uh, new uh, advances that we've been making in chatbot space, uh, AR, VR, and of course, voice, and how it promises to disrupt our industry, disrupt content in general, and really change the way we interact with information about the world around us. And back in 2018, Gertner was really leaning in to chatbots and their close cousin voice interfaces like Siri and, and, and Alexa and the like. And that they predicted that by 2020, we would see a huge uptake of chatbot adoption by large uh, and medium enterprises. And that by 2021, the most enterprises would be completely immersed in chatbots um, to serve the information needs of their organization and their customers. And this is where I do that record scratch thing. No, didn't happen. Why? Well, um, I'm gonna suggest that the technology even back then was pretty good, but our content wasn't ready for it. And you know, I think this is really uh, key to understanding. You know, where where are we, and why why are we not further ahead in uh, adopting AI or working with AI uh, with information? And it comes down to the content that we have to work with and that AI has to learn from in order to be able to serve us. So the technology, like I say, has been around and it's been in development for some time. In fact, in uh, 2019, OpenAI uh, made its announcements about its first generative AI um, language models uh, that were capable of some pretty impressive um, uh, creative writing, if you will, um, being able to write children's stories and Christmas carols and um, all the rest of it, if you will. Um, very, very impressive uh, results. But they weren't ready to release it to the general public. And, and again, not because the technology wasn't impressive, uh, but because the impact that this technology could have on our society, and particularly at that particular point in in time, that fear was that by releasing this this engine, this model, uh, to the public, that um, it could cause more harm than good. And then, of course, that all changed in November 2022 when they did decide to release ChatGPT, GPT three. Uh, dot five um, to a unsuspecting public, really not ready for this technology and what it really means um, for society, for for our profession, for our livelihood, for our jobs, right? And so it's been uh, raising a lot of questions, a lot of concerns in most people's heads within our industry, to be quite frank. In fact, when I first saw it back in December, uh, my business partner sent me an email and said, I have to check out this insane tech. I was a little skeptical, but I did. And I fell off my chair. Even though I've been talking about chatbots and voice for five, six years, 
I wasn't ready for this, right? And it wasn't really what it was saying so much as how it was saying it. So any of you who have children who are entering adulthood now will think back to their own past as children growing up before the internet. We had uh, an amazing information resource at our disposal, most of us. That was dad. Dad could answer any question we had for him. And he did with a plum answer just about any question, whether it had to do with medicine or geopolitics or geography or creative writing. He just he just knew it all. And well, um, so we thought, right? Uh, of course, when we're raising our own children decades later, um, we realized that our fathers really didn't know as much as maybe we thought they did um, because, you know, our children were constantly debunking our beliefs, you know, pulling out the cell phone and Google and saying, Dad, no, no, you don't really know what you're talking about. And, well, I had to learn to uh, adapt to that. Um, having so much information, readily, readily available information at our fingertips really changed the, tip the scales of fatherhood for me anyway. Um, but now when we move towards chat GPT, like I said, when I first saw it, it really threw me for a loop. And again, not for what it said, but how it said it. I've been more accustomed to interacting with chatbots where it would ask clarifying questions or it would be very, very narrowly scoped to respond to my queries and my, and my questions. Um, and most of the time, it just wouldn't know the answer and it would say so. But not ChatGPT. Now, ChatGPT uh, was ready to give you a pat answer at the click of a button. Um, and if it didn't quite know everything, well, kind of like dad, it just filled in the holes and made it all sound very plausible. And that was, to me, kind of terrifying, but also fascinating, realizing that as we evolve, as we go forward working with AI and working with information differently, we're moving towards voice, right, where we're walking around with AI in an earpiece. And you know what does that what does that mean for us? It means that we won't have the benefit of a, a, a screen full of search results to help us answer questions in our day to day. We're going to be reliant on our systems, our machines, to be able to give us the best possible answer in one earful when we ask a question. And maybe it won't always know the answer. Um, correctly, but it'll give us a good enough answer. So, you know, when we look to the GPT, of course, the best way to find out, well, hey, GPT, tell us about what we're in for and, you know, what we have to look forward to and how are we going to help our customers and our clients and our staff adapt to this new technology? Well, I think I'm alluding to it a little bit um, so far. And well, uh, we've got a bit of a long game here in developing trust. But you may be surprised to see that already ChatGPT has come quite a long way in helping to establish trust in the information that it presents to us in terms of consistency, clarity, some degree accuracy. And then we start moving into areas where we still have some room to develop, such as being able to uh, ascertain the credibility of the source. Where did you learn that from, Chad GPT? Um, transparency. Do you really know that or did you make that up? And then, of course, 
emotional connection. But we can see that as we look to build next generation of these tools, we will find ways to improve on uh, the credibility of the source and even on its transparency and even perhaps um, on creating greater emotional connections, which is what we need to be able to better trust the information that we get from our AI sources. Now, when we look to chat and voice, we have a, a couple of different um, factors that we need to take into consideration. Of course, for written communication, language proficiency, and format and structure are also very, very important to add credibility to written communication. But again, I want to suggest the long game is really voice, oral communication, where we also need to learn to be able to tune our content for um, tone and voice and find some way to find nonverbal cues to better improve the trustworthiness of that information to ensure that we really do believe it, or that means avatars or interacting with information in AR or VR type of experiences um, where you know we need to have information that we can really trust very, very well. And you know, all with a view to moving towards a more omni-channel world. Chat GPT and its ability to be able to rewrite content, recast content has some pretty amazing implications for us. Being able to create hyper-personalized content from the same source. Um, if you've ever tried working with ChatGPT and said, hey, um, rewrite my resume in the voice of Ernest Hemingway, or you know, give me a uh, my mother's birthday card, turn it into a sonnet, um, by William Shakespeare, and you'll see that it actually does quite a good job at being able to recast the tone um, and uh, the, the voice of that content. Now imagine being able to do that at, an, at a, a hyper-personalized rate, being able to personalize the tone and voice to much more focused and, and tighter segmented audiences with things like ChatGPT. Um, being able to improve things such as online and uh, AR, uh, voice uh, and, and, uh, and augmented reality type of experiences, but still being able to source it from a single source of truth, which is still ultimately necessary to ensure the trustworthiness of uh, that information as we move across different modalities. So I think we've got some very, very exciting things. Uh, in our future that we need to learn how to better architect solutions for and, and move forward with. And of course, if you're a technical communicator like me and you know maybe you've invested 20 years in something like, uh, I don't know, XML DITA, you might have questions such as, well, is DITA even still relevant? Uh, with AI and generative AI being able to produce content for us? Well, good news is I think it does. Um, I think that DITA has a very strong place. And, you know, I think we only need to look at um, some of the problems we're experiencing already with generative AI, where we see a lot of work going into refining the algorithms and machine learning around uh, generative AI. But also realizing that we need to spend a lot more time cleaning up data and ensuring that these algorithms have good data to work from. Garbage in, garbage out never was as important as it is today with the content that we look to feed our artificial intelligence systems with. In fact, we're seeing um, um, a, a real difference between academia and industry, where industry such as, industry such as Tesla 
and others are putting a lot more effort into cleaning their data, scrubbing their data, improving the quality of their data. And that's where DITA, XML structured authoring, really has a play here, is that by focusing on improving the precision of our content using frameworks such as, as DITA, um, we help to really enrich our information much more than on any other sort of content platform, whether it's JSON or Markdown or, or other desktop publishing tools. We have the ability to create highly precise content that we're able to not just be able to take the text and deliver it to machines, but also extract more meaning from that content, from the metadata and the structures underlying that content. So um, I've got a short list here of, of, of some of the things that really help to contribute to uh, making this move from our more traditional delivery models to AI-driven models, such as structured authoring for ensuring consistency, um, information typing, for being able to help convey the intended reader response for information to AI. Semantic tagging to improve or eliminate um, ambiguity. Uh, content chunking, allowing us to modularize this content much better and then be able to uh, manipulate it far more effectively. And of course, metadata and labeling. And the fact that you know, even working with an open standard, meaning that we can integrate or more easily integrate our standard XML with other information sources and other formats. So if you've done any amount of reading into how ChatGPT works, you may understand already that it's all about the math. It's all about taking segments of text and comparing them against vectors so that AI can refine and predict not just words, but letters that follow or naturally follow one after the next based on a, um, a, a user's inquiry uh, into the system, into the prompts, right? And this means that uh, text that, that we use is used to feed and build out large language models. In fact, Presently, GPT does not understand structure, does not understand XML. It doesn't understand underlying semantics. It consumes text, right? There's a lot of work to um, see how can we leverage some of this metadata along with the text to create richer experiences. Um, to be able to convey more information um, that is only implied in the structure, in the presentation of that information. So to solve that, we need to be able to make better use of our content models, of our metadata, of our structures to provide additional information to just the written word on the page but more information about how that information is structured because that structure in itself has meaning. Um, consider how do we break down a table into narrative content, into something that can be used in voice and conveyed, can be conveyed in voice and that we can use to help build out these strings that inform uh, generative AI programs. Um, can we take um, our XML and uh, adapt it to feed knowledge graphs and larger co content or knowledge models uh, to be able to get even more intelligence out of our content. And to that end is where we really look to working with um, leading edge or bleeding edge content management systems and CCMSs such as 
uh, Adobe Experience Manager guides um, to uh, really support um, rich content models, uh, specialized XML, um, uh, very rich metadata handling that will allow us to enrich the content we already have to be able to provide even deeper meaning into the content that we provide uh, to AI. So I want to take a little bit step back to last year about this time um, when I had, uh, again, the pleasure of uh, giving a, a, a keynote. This time it was on micro content, structure, precision, and publishing, including chatbots. So um, I already had an opportunity to sort of roll with this whole chatbot um, idea and the importance of how we move towards that um, and continue to build momentum with that. So I think just a little bit of a, um, a recap, even on micro content, what I mean by micro content uh, in this is helping to build the structures for content that is better able, more flexible, more um, intuitive to be able to build and maintain not just our current um, uh, delivery channels and, and modalities, but brand new modalities, such as AI and, and voice and uh, content as a service type of delivery. So micro content is about one primary idea. It's easily scannable. It's labeled or titled and appropriately written and formatted for use anywhere and any time it's needed. Uh, yeah, uh, no Zoolander. It's it's not micro content just because it's small. It, it, in fact, uh, intelligent micro content um, really relies on four key areas um, to be able to ensure that we've got good micro content that we can use. So focus, uh, meaning that we focus on writing about one thing. We can focus our information in our writing in micro content so that we can more easily unpack information um, for publishing and for um, uh, working with uh, AI type of interfaces. Um, we have function, which means that we classify information according to intent. This is an important consideration for understanding you know, how do we need to write our content such that we can more easily inform um, chatbot type of experiences and voice uh, type of experiences with structured content? And of course, we've got structure. And we're at Ditto World, so presumably you already have a good idea what structured content is. Um, and Tony Self's uh, this description is really, really quite apt. But you know, I think it's important to call out that structured content and XML are not the same thing. In fact, structured authoring predates XML and what we know today is structured authoring by decades. And, you know, it's interesting to me is, is um, this exhibit on this slide here, uh, if you Google, go to Google Scholar and you look up Robert Horn and information mapping, you'll be able to see the scan of structured content authored on a typewriter, right? I mean, I've seen lots of technical writers use an XML editor like a typewriter. He was using a typewriter like an XML editor, so it's structured editor. Anyway, fascinating. But important to understand that structured authoring isn't just about the markup, isn't just about the technology, but about the words and how we write that information, how we organize that information, how we structure it. And then context, of course, is that we need to be able to uh, be able to take that information and take it apart and put it back together again. So working with traditional documents and with CCMSs, we have a lot of metadata that we can leverage to be able to enrich micro content such that we can deliver it and use it 
in content as a service type delivery and be able to serve all many more channels for omni-channel type delivery, where we can take the content payload, we can take its metadata, and we can package it and then deliver it using content as a service type delivery, where we can be feeding any number of different types of distribution channels and publishing solutions. So what's next for us? And what's being ready actually mean? Well, looking at Adobe Experience Manager guide, uh, guides, we, I mean, we, we really understand that, that this is a tool that, that really does support specialization and, and rich content models, if we build them. If we build those models, then we've got tools to support them. And to be able to really leverage that content at publishing time, to be able to serve many new channels for that content and be able to serve out uh, content that we can use to train uh, generative AI, we can use to distribute through content as a service type delivery while still maintaining our traditional delivery channels for that content. Our journey towards micro content is simply the next step the evolution of intelligent content needed to support our new channel delivery. So I want to thank you all for your time today. And if you do have any questions, please uh, drop me a line. You can look me up on LinkedIn um, or send me an email at uh, Precision Content. I look forward to uh, um, talk to you again soon and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks for your time today. Hello and welcome to hear about customer case uh, with Kone Corporation. The topic of today is uh, using Adobe Experience Manager guides and the power of data to create content for multi-channel delivery. That is a long title, but hopefully you will enjoy the show. And let's start by introducing ourselves. So my name is Hanna Heidon and I work in Connect R&D uh, with the title Digital Content Lead. Uh, I have around 20 years of experience from the technical documentation domain. So I have been working in different roles within technical communications, basically all throughout my career. My main, main focus areas are information architecture and design, user-centered, task-based documentation, data XML, content management systems, digital delivery, channels and then my special interest is XR uh, and I'm also going to be defending my PhD thesis in that area in August. And then Christian, please introduce yourself. Yes, uh, I also from my behalf, Christian Forsma, and uh, I'm uh, basically you working in uh, Kone IT, so more on the IT side of the uh, content solutions and been basically doing this kind of job for quite some time so started started with uh, data content creation already when it was IBM data but basically been more more focused on the technical solutions related to content management uh, especially the delivery part so thank welcome from my behalf as well all right and let's move into the domain we'll First, introduce Kone as a company because not probably some of you are not familiar with our business. So just to give you a little bit of context. So Kone, uh, we work in the elevator escalator business uh, and we are a global leader in those. And of course, our drive here is to make cities better places to live with our, our equipment and our technology. We are really innovative and uh, focus also on sustainability uh, with our new equipment solutions, but also offer quite a lot of uh, uh, business in the, in the maintenance area and different solutions there. 
Finnish company founded in the beginning of the 20th century and uh, operate currently in more than 60 countries with over 60,000 employees, over half a million customers and also listed in the Helsinki Stock Exchange. If you are in, in more interested in the figures, you can find more information on Kone website. But this is what we are especially interested in, a typical day at Kone. So um, if you look at our, our figures from there, so 1.1 million units in service daily, uh, around 80,000 maintenance visits, about 50, uh, 550,000 customers uh, and operations in 60 countries. So that means that when somebody is working on an elevator, fixing an elevator, uh, uh, they really cannot rely on knowing each and every single equipment. And they also cannot rely on calling somebody who knows it. So we need to make sure that these people know what they're doing and they do it efficiently in each of these countries. So this is what is driving our development at Kone uh, within the technical uh, documentation domain. Uh, moving on, uh, elevators. Uh, they used to be silent boxes on a rope, so mechanical equipment. But what has happened uh, within the past, I would say, five to ten years, uh, they've become, become more and more digital. Uh, we get lots of remote data, we get lots of um, um, data into the clouds and lots of analytics into that data. So it is more or less now a, also a software side of business and digital business as well. Our aim is, of course, to fix any problems before they cause a breakdown. So we don't want the, uh, the so-called call outs. Uh, where you cannot use your elevator. So if we see that something is not working as it should, we go and fix it before you actually even notice that. So that is easier for us and then of course easier for the customers and end users as well. I have a short video here um, to show, show how this uh, works. So let's go in there and watch that video. Every day, around the clock, data is flowing from intelligent, cloud-connected elevators and escalators. But where is it going? And what happens to it? The answer lies with Kone 24-7 Connected Services. We can use the data to improve equipment performance, reliability, and safety, and solve problems before they cause breakdowns. Kone 24-7 Connected Services uses advanced Internet of Things technologies to bring intelligent services to elevators and escalators. Vast amounts of data are collected around the clock from sensors installed in the equipment. Let's take a closer look at how it works. Sensors in an elevator or escalator gather data about critical parameters like usage levels, movement, and speed. This data then flows to the cloud where the digital brain behind the operation intelligent algorithms can do their work. By comparing the information with data gathered from thousands of other identical units maintained by Kone, the system can quickly see if something doesn't look quite right, allowing us to take preventive action. So what happens when the system can see that something might be going wrong? Here the data is showing that these elevator doors are reopening too often starting to close, then opening again before they're completely shut. This information is automatically passed on to our maintenance team. When a problem does occur, one of our customer care center agents will send a technician to the site immediately to fix it. If there's no immediate risk of a breakdown, our technician will check the relevant components during the next scheduled maintenance visit. For cases that need a little extra attention, one of our technical experts will analyze the equipment data and decide if an additional maintenance visit is needed. It is a cognitive system, which means it gets progressively smarter every time it processes a piece of data. This means our data analysts can continuously improve the way the system works by feeding in data and teaching it new things. 
Kone 24-7 Connected Services brings together cutting-edge technologies and intelligent algorithms with the expertise of Kone people. The human touch plays a key role in delivering and continuously improving our services. With our digital channels, you see what we see. You can check how your equipment is performing and review what maintenance work we've done using the Kone online portal. And when you're on the move, you can get real-time updates from the Kone mobile app on your smartphone. This transparency means you can stay one step ahead and always keep the right people in the know. For people who use escalators and elevators every day, cloud-connected equipment means a safer, smoother journey. And for our customers, it means fewer unexpected problems and a clear picture of everything that's going on. Okay, going back to the presentation. So, hope you got the idea of, of how our some of our solutions now work with the remote data and and the connected services. All right, let's move into the domain we are mostly interested in. So, technical documentation, and this is the Kone Kone technical documentation, of course. So, what I always like to say is the content is the queen. So the content is what actually drives drives the world. We have, of course, lots of different types of content content uh, in in the world and, of course, in the in the businesses. But uh, one really important part of this is the instructions we give to either our maintenance technicians, installation installation people, or then the end users and the content rules that world. Then, when we talk about content, we of course need tools. They are the enablers for the queen. So without the tools, we cannot, of course, produce and deliver that content to where we need that to go. Connect content creation. I will now shortly um, show you how how we what is our vision and how we have organized within within Connect technical documentation content creation team. So global presence, as I said, uh, operations in about 60 countries. Uh, we have R&D centers uh, globally and on almost every continent. I work in the Hyvinkä, Hyvinkä location in, in Finland. Uh, and our um, teams are then located in, in the US and Mexico, uh, India and China, in ad addition to the Hyvinkä team. So we are a global business serving serving different sites and of course working in different time zones even within our own department. Then content creation at Kone. AM Guides has been in use since 2020. Christian will give you some insight into our setup uh, in a while. But what we are doing within Kone technical documentation, we are implementing uh, data 1.3 uh, that has been implemented since the migration into AEM. Data 1.2 has been in use since 2015 when we uh, first started started our XML journey. So data is something that we are really serious about, and we of course love data in in my department. Our uh, focus has been keeping it as simple as possible. We are not customizing anything unless it's uh, strictly necessary. We haven't actually customized anything yet, so we've gone pretty far without customizing anything. Oasis data out of the box. And we're also using a limited set of elements. Uh, data includes quite a lot of software side of things that we are currently not using. Uh, I said that we are moving into the software side of things, but even there we've li uh, really limited the set of elements for simplicity purposes and, of course, for the ease of authoring as well. Our vision is always to have one source, then reuse and single source with that. So if possible, we always like to um, use whatever is, is uh, there already. So we do this across the information products that we use. 
and then also across the delivery channels. So trying to find anything that is already there, already written, already translated, and then reusing and single sourcing that same, same content. Content creators at Kone. So with AEM guides, we have around 45 content creators globally, uh, as I said, working in different time zones. And then if we look at the whole of AEM, including the asset management, uh, around 100 users globally. So AEM guides is only one part of our, our setup. But uh, then, of course, we have uh, opportunities for reuse and cooperation also outside of Connect Technical documentation and teams local, uh, located uh, globally. That give, gives us lots of opportunities, of course, but then also challenges uh, with different different things. Of course, uh, China, India, Mexico, never basically working in the same time zone. So that requires quite a lot of, quite a lot of um, coordination within, within our teams. So Kone content creation uh, vision, so I already touched on this, but here's something uh, like a more in-depth look at this. So we want to reuse content across publications. Uh, we started with topic level reuse, so we tried to create independent, uh, whenever possible, of course, independent units, uh, topics that can be easily reused. And uh, of course, that means that leaving out things like uh, reuse barriers like uh, product names for example uh, then moved on also to conriffing and then have been implementing now also conditional profiling within our teams you can also see that we are not using the all of the data advanced features yet we also want to keep it keep it simple if possible so we do not want to put in uh, it can implement something just for, for the sake of implementing it. So we try to find reasoning and we want to find like, uh, let's say, wins with anything we do uh, instead of trying to just do fancy, fancy, fancy things. So that is also easier from our global setup point of view. Then if we move into the single sourcing side, so across media, uh, we are reusing or oh, single sourcing whole publications uh, with data maps and, and all the related topics. Uh, and then also we can single source, single topics topics within. So different channels. We are not limiting the channels. Um, Christian will also talk about the outputs that we currently have, but I always say that the, there is no basically limit where you can go with this. So you can always start single sourcing to another, another um, media when you feel like it or when the business requires it maybe maybe more like that another thing that we have been really uh, pushing uh, lately is going from static publications to dynamically built publications so if you look at static publications they are pre-generated published as they are uh, so you basically compile uh, uh, data map with topics and then publish that into into uh, different output formats and then it is used as it is. This is of course a one size fits all uh, standard solution. Can be definitely in multiple formats, so you can you can still publish the different channels, but it will always be the be the same publication uh, regardless of who is using it or uh, basically for which equipment that is for. But we have now uh, worked um, heavily on uh, moving into more dynamic way of way of publishing, so so that our publications could be compiled on the fly based on the needs. Um, they are personalized and customized mainly now uh, on from the equipment point of view, but of course other factors can come in here. So you might have a, have a different publication for one piece of equipment equipment and then when you move and maintain another one you will have another customized piece of piece of uh, information for that one and of course this can also be this can be also in multiple formats so um, coming from xml of course then you can show them in html pdf or anything else that you uh, uh, basically are implementing but this is now giving us our our uh, documentation more personalized 
look and feel, of course, and then also helping in task completion because then we can offer more ac accurate instructions for, for um, maintenance, for example. Then I also like to also talk about contextual information. So instead of uh, doing those uh, static, uh, basically one size fits all information products, uh, we like to focus on precisely what the maintenance technician needs in for each task is each specific situation and their needs based on the on the on the task that they need to complete so task completion is at the core of what we do with our information design and information architecture uh, they want to find precisely what they want what they need and of course avoid the irrelevant so in many cases if you include uh, lots of different options and that specific equipment, it, they don't have it, then it is just clutter and nonsense to that maintenance technician. So we like to uh, focus on what is actually precisely with that equipment. And then again, information that adapts to you, to the, to the person using it and the device they are using. So scalable and responsive information. And of course, moving into into uh, also being offered intelligent suggestions uh, of different alternative ways of doing it, or or then also alternative ways of learning. Learning. So we also work in uh, together with our learning and 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 development to try to uh, develop a a like a whole whole concept for them. So that that would then offer them uh, the, from novices to experts like a good experience on using using the information. And then Christian, to you for the AEM more technical side of AEM setup. Thank you. Yes. So let's look at our journey a little bit. So uh, we started the. Uh, 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 XML journey in, in 2015. Uh, then, then Kone only were using SGML and, and, and nothing really, not that much reuse and so forth. But, but I think this is a bit bit old slide was shown already earlier in in some some uh, uh, event. But I wanted to show here that that we have taken deliberate steps and planned planned steps and enhancing our solutions. Uh, step by step. So you need to start from somewhere, but but our XML journey in Kona started basically in 2015. Uh, probably to shortly highlight here, so we did the AEM transition in 2020 during worst pandemic time, but uh, managed to migrate to AEM uh, during 2020. So if we a little bit look deeper into what we have in AEM today. So so we are on the managed service uh, option. We're running uh, AEM guides, non-UUID. We have plans to move to, to the UUID version of uh, guides uh, as soon as possible, but might might uh, still be a bit delayed late this year, hopefully. Uh, we are also using a single sign-on solution that is common for, for Kone, uh, which means that we are actually managing uh, the users outside outside AEM itself. So user access and uh, role access happens through uh, the Kone common uh, single sign-on solution. Uh, probably something to note here, we are uh, only using the web uh, editor. So. Uh, this was something that was debatable in the beginning uh, when we moved to, to AEM that can a web editor actually work for a big team like this with uh, specific content creation needs. But uh, so far, business has been happy with using the, uh, only the web editor. So we are not using any thick clients. We are only using the inbuilt web editor in AEM guide. Uh, because uh, Adobe Experience Manager is an asset management solution, uh, we, ha we are also in Kone using the same solution on marketing and training, training teams. So they are basically storing and managing their 
assets in AEM as well. Currently, uh, we are only having one publisher license or publishing uh, uh, publisher instance, uh, let's say so, uh, meaning that uh, it is only the marketing team that is uh, publishing their assets through uh, a publisher's in instance. In the authoring, we are having help from Acrolinks. So it is important when, uh, as Hanna mentioned, the authoring teams are sitting all over, all over the globe, we want to have a consistent tone of voice and using the same terms and whatsoever. So we are using the, mm, I would say, very, very well working integration with, with the XML editor. So we're checking our content against uh, Acrolix. Also the illustration teams that are creating our drawings and, and illustrations for technical uh, content, uh, they are uh, linking uh, via their creative tools are uh, using the asset link. And last but not least, also we have now in production dynamic media. That means that on the Conecom side, sites, uh, they are able to uh, in, uh, use the dynamic media renditions of content that is published from the marketing teams. Uh, Anna mentioned a little bit, but of course I have the PDF option here. <laughs> Uh, as the first one, but of course we are trying to move away to more dynamic and uh, and uh, responsive options. But of course uh, we need to be able to create PDFs. Our current process is the demand that we have a version of of um, installation and maintenance uh, documents also in, in in PDF formats. A couple of different formats there, but but I would say that the the big move is to to try to to get more into this. Dynamic, as, as Anna mentioned as well, so we are also publishing the same uh, single sourced content into a solution where we are delivering the content like more uh, portal portal type of solution. So all, all of our installation and maintenance documents are also available in a browsable, browsable view. Um, probably the important one what comes to the augmented reality tests we have been doing and so forth is that our uh, delivery solution also is uh, available using REST API. So that means basically that we have applications, uh, small application for instance, uh, for technicians, and the, the content uh, in that in those applications are actually retrieved via via no, programmatically via via the rest apis so that it kind of kind of guides the technicians to the right right uh, instructions uh, and also helps helps them in their their work uh, related to that so i i, I tend to call uh, our aem guide solution uh, as the how solution in in Kone. so so basically answering the how to how to install how to maintain how to do things in a safe way uh, also aligning it with the meta developers that are kind of constantly trying to make our methods smarter better safer uh, and so forth but actually what and when uh, solution is not what AEM is. So we have, uh, as we saw in the video, we have AI, AI uh, uh, tools that analyze what, what could have or what has gone wrong, trying to prevent things. And, and whenever the technician gets the task in, in, into his hand, uh, then AEM is basically the enabler for, for giving the correct instructions for the user. What are we experimenting with? Uh, I'm using a phrase, or we are using a phrase here from one of our colleagues. So basically, we have noticed that hey, we we have the content. We have a lot of good content uh, that's been created by our teams. So let's not let's let's use it. So in that point of view, we think that the future is really really bright, and and uh, wanting to show one example of that. Uh, we have been 
already for some years been testing with smart smart glasses and and the nice thing here is that uh, the content is created uh, by the content teams we are using the same content to deliver pdfs or uh, content to the portal uh, but it can also be leveraged in uh, smart glasses so this is one of the beauty of uh, beauties of, of data of course that we are creating semantical content and if you are really uh, checking the small pictures you can actually see that it is me uh, trying to use the smart glasses to do a simple task and I have to uh, highlight that I'm not a technician so I'm a, really not a technician but I was actually able to follow the instruction quite nicely uh, with the glasses so it was a really nice nice experience the one thing still to to, to show the final final slide here that no matter what we are kind of creating and how fancy things we are doing a little bit second in second in here uh Hanna went when saying that we don't use all the, the data features it doesn't matter how fancy things we are doing if we are not helping the the human so it is all everything we do we are trying to make it easy safe for the actual technician to to do their job that is the prior one and i guess that ends our short presentation so we are now open for questions hello everybody and thank you for joining me amanda patterson for don't reinvent the wheel implemented structured authoring where today we're going to look at where my implementation process is kind of a little bit of where we came from and where we're going to be going next so how it started it started obviously pretty simple and i built this sketch in my head based on the things that you folks are doing now did a world presentations, Adobe white papers, um, textbooks on the subject, blogs on the subject. And, you know, in all of those instances, everything was presented very clean. And I, you know, I really believe that what was laid out was exactly what I needed to do to successfully implement structured authoring and migrate all of my content from unstructured to a structured authoring instance and we even have a term for these ironically coming from me doing one of these presentations is that it's a customer success story and where customers of Adobe such as myself will come and and talk to you about how great this process was and I'll lay it out and it'll be beautiful and simple I'm sorry that's not going to be this presentation we're going to look at where the challenges were and why the implementation was still successful despite those challenges. So how it's going. I went again from that simple little sketch into realizing I needed a much more robust solution. The project was bigger than I thought, even though I knew the implementation projects were slated to be 18, 24, 32 months long, I didn't necessarily understand what all went into it and how much work each step really was. And I think that's a huge first lesson is in really setting expectations for yourself, your team, your stakeholders. What is this really going to take? And what, like how complicated is this process? You can do some content migrations this way, but that's just moving from you know what you currently have into maybe a new into a new software to author in but if you're really looking at actually implementing from unstructured to structured authoring it is going to be this it is going to be this much bigger and much more complex project because it's not just what you're going to document and how you're going to document, it's really going to take changing people's perspectives on what you're authoring and how to actually author documents. It's going to take some real brain power to change minds and to change comprehension of what authoring actually means. So I'm going to walk through some of 
some of these challenges that we faced. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of the considerations that we took when making decisions. They may be the same for you. They may be slightly different, and they might be the same considerations, but your answers and your circumstances may be different. So I hope that you kind of take these a little bit with a grain of salt and really look at how can you apply some of the concepts that I'm talking about here for you. So that gets me to my my wheel. What am I? What did I end up trying to build, and where am I coming from? So Hunter Douglas is a luxury window coverings manufacturer. In short, we're a consumer goods manufacturer of all custom products. Very few of our products that come off of our manufacturing floors are exactly the same. Um, they will vary you know, either wildly by shape and style, but they also may just vary by dimension that we have to adjust for that. So it's a very complicated product or set of products um, and a very complicated manufacturing environment. My team, uh, I have five people that report to me. We are responsible for two brands, over 20 products, uh, 10 or 15 operating systems. So the operating systems being how the, sh how the window covering functions and moves, um, six design options. And so for us, our design options are we have windows that, window coverings that open like this, we have window coverings that open like this, and we have window coverings that open like this. So all of those are obviously multiples, so we have a lot of customization that happens and a lot of robust documentation that goes along with it. In terms of our content, overall we have eight different types of content, and there are two of those types that have roughly, as I'll talk about a little later, we found out have about 90-some percent content reusability, not just within each doc type, or content type, but also across content types. So one of our problems is how do we author this without all the manual repetition of the same authoring tasks and to make sure that our documentation is consistent and clear across all of the documents that we author. <clears throat> and then of the two content types that we chose to work with to start the implementation, we have about 300 documents, and that's about 5,000 pages of content. Um, it may be a little more depending exactly how you kind of cut, slice, and calculate that. So where we are starting from is Adobe InDesign, and we have been in Adobe InDesign House for a very long time. So I have a lot of legacy content that was gifted to me when I took over this team about three years ago. And where we're going is we're going to push this content into structured authoring using Adobe Experience Manager and AEM Guides will be our authoring instant. So let's, um, let's take a step back and let's look at why structured authoring. <clears throat> so structured authoring allows you to do a lot of things and takes out a lot of the manual repetition of content authoring and maintenance. For example, it will improve your content consistency and quality because you will author once and use in many places. It will enhance your content reuse and modularity. So by really thinking about how are you going to break down your content and how it functions and how each piece of that content functions and where can you, you know, break those apart so that you can use them more like Lego blocks to build documents instead of that same copy and paste or have it worse having to remember where did you write that and should this say the exact same thing or be slightly different or is it the same thing but with variation based on location or audience or something like that. So that maintenance component is really going to be much more easier to do when you're off when your content is structured. Again, increase in fish efficiencies because this will, where you are used to be authoring in many places, you'll be authoring in one place and producing in many documents at the same time. If you are a company or a shop that is looking for translation, because you're going to remove the presentation layer 
of this, you're going to streamline your localization and your translation processes because then your translation, your translators, or if your translator doesn't have a doc desktop publishing group, your team would all be streamlined because you won't have to do all of the editing and layout based on different languages and different text lengths and all of that. And lastly, there's a scalability quality to this, that once you have this system in place, you can future-proof it um, so that if you add new products or you subtract products or you add audiences or you subtract audiences or whatever other changes may be coming in your organization, your content can grow and expand with that fairly easily. And again, it the, the moral of the story here is no repetition, lose the manual labor part of authoring in order to, in order for, you know, fast, efficient, and effective content creation. The how all this happens, we're going to talk a little bit about um, throughout the presentation, but these are, these are the key reasons of why you want to do this. Content reuse, authoring and maintenance efficiencies, streamlined translation, modularity of content and scalability and future proofing of your content. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about why this happens and how this happens. So this is one of the case studies that I used. Um, I've taken some of the detail out of it just for confidentiality reasons, but this is the automated authoring case study that I presented to my stakeholders in order to get approval for implementation of structured authoring. And I, the key about this is that it really explains what structured authoring is, um, because when you try to explain this to tech writers, even those of us in the field is kind of a little bit of a mind warp. When you start trying to explain this to people outside of tech docs, it gets that much harder. So your current situation, you probably author in five or six different places and you have to author that same paragraph. Or again, that same paragraph may need to be authored in five or six places based on another factor, a localization, an audience or something. So something in that paragraph changes slightly. With structured authoring, instead of that manual copy and paste and do the layout work, you author it in that one location and then it proliferates into all of your other documents based on where you link it. So it's author once, produce many. Um, you stop authoring in 50 some odd documents and we started looking at man maintaining about three content chunks or three topics and 10 images and one keyword were all that we then had to maintain. Not not the three content chunks and 10 images and one keyword scattered in 50 documents. It much more controlled environment, one author in one place, proliferate in many. Again, looking at duplicated content, um, one of, we have been asked to expand one of our documents to include a new audience, but that audience doesn't get everything in the original document that we had. So it was sort of like, we want that document, but only about half the content. Okay, that's a huge ask because you are literally duplicating your content. That means that you have a whole nother place that you have to author, you have to update, you have to correct, you have to maintain. It's twice the work, no matter how you cut it. But that duplication of authoring and maintenance goes away in structured authoring because you're you're grabbing pieces that you've already authored. You're grabbing those sort of Lego block like content and and duplicating that through links in all of your documents. In DITA, they're called maps. So again, you can just sort of grab the pieces that you want without rewriting them, without recreating them, and just build a new map or and put those pieces that you need into that document. And creating a new document that's slightly different than the original will take minutes, at least for the first draft, minutes and not hours. So your ability to go from start to finish in creating a new document 
is much, much faster. Speed to market is key here. The faster we can create documents, the more content we can work with, the more products we can support, the more valuable we are to our companies. So how does all of this happen? How do we actually do this? What's the secret? And the, the secret behind all of this really great content reuse is the DITA Open Toolkit. And DITA stands for Darwin Information Typing Architecture. And DITA is an open source publishing tool set specifically designed for content. Um, it's a collection of software components and scripts that enable the transformation of data-based XML source files into various output forms, such as HTML, PDF, and XML. Okay, so that's, the, that's their official definition. DITA is the framework that will give you what structured authoring is. It gives you the words to, to break your content apart in a way that the computers can read and the scripts can read to get all the reuse, to have the duplication, to have the author in one place repeat in many. Um, and it allows for you to stop authoring the documents and start thinking about how your content functions. So that way you don't have to go through and go like, oh, well, this is a heading one, so it should be this color and this size, and I have to change this in every instance. It will, all of that formatting, it, when you get the output class, it surfaces based on that format. So again, the idea is if it's a heading, it gets labeled a heading. If it's a body paragraph, it gets labeled a body paragraph. If it's an ordered list, it gets labeled as that. If it's an unordered list, it gets labeled as something else. And what this means is that in every instance of use of that functional title, your content will surface in the output in the exact same way. So you won't have bullets that are at three, three and a smidge, 3.25 inches in from the tab. It's all exactly the same. It's the same bullet. It's the same size bullet. It's the same spacing everywhere because you're now thinking about your content in functional means, not just, I need it to fit here in this place. Um, I love it because it really eliminates the idea of having to worry about the formatting. I can focus strictly on what I'm writing and make sure that what I am writing is correct in form, fit, and function. I know it'll fit based on the form that I'm writing it, because I know the function that it plays in my documentation. Um, so DITA provides you the language to make those classifications, to organize it based on words that are industry standards that everybody is using, that soft output software is aware of and can translate. To kind of get into this a little bit more is that DITA has, um, I, I thought it was a little bit more, about 170 some odd elements and those 170 elements work together and individually to format your document, to structure your content. Um, in addition, there are also attributes in your, that are available that will allow you to, um, you know, further delineate your content that just because it's a task topic, if that's its function to do a procedure, that task may change based on audience. So you can add those attributes to, ch to um, have those instances where it's almost the same except for this one part. Um, there are lots of attributes for audience, role, class, output class. You can have many answers for each of those attributes and all of those attributes can get applied to many of the elements. And so if you're kind of doing the napkin math of like thinking about this, your brain is probably starting to like, you know, run, run around and you're starting to get a little anxious about how much of this stuff do I actually need to know and how do I know how it all fits together? Because the next part is that the elements 
work in conjunction with each other. And sometimes you can have one element in one space and another element in another space, but not the opposite. So there's a lot of customization that you can do, and that's part of the scalability. Because you can cut it, cut and slice your content down so minutely, that gives it the modularity to pick and choose and rebuild for reuse and the modularity that you need to scale this as you increase in the products that you're supporting. It's also what makes is uh, this is also the difference between that little sketch of a Ferris wheel and a full on rideable carnival Ferris wheel because this is where the complication comes in. This is where the complexity comes in. This is where I started to get overwhelmed just once I figured this out. And then I said, okay, how do I, how do I wrap my head around this? Like I'm, I'm in, I get that there's this framework called Dita and it's really complicated, but I know lots of people are using it and I just need to apply it to tech comms at Hunter Douglas. How do I do that? And that's when I started looking at, okay, no, really, what kind of Ferris wheel do I need to build? What does this look like here where I am? So I started looking at how much content do I have? What content lends itself best to this kind of a process? And that's looking at what has the highest reuse value for my lowest effort in, to input. And how do I figure that out? I started to really read my content, all of it, and as painful as that may be, but to really read it and internalize it, to know my content, to know how each section of my documents function, to figure out where things are the same, where they should be the same, where the same, but they should be slightly different, why they are slightly different in those instances. What's the attribute that's driving that vari variation? Um, and started to look at, okay, I know, you know, how many documents does this apply to? How many pages? Um, I even started to look into like how many characters this might be. There are lots of places online that you can um, just look up you know, how, what's the average character count per page and that sort of stuff to kind of get some of these numbers. No, I did not one by one count characters on pages of content. Ain't nobody got time for that. Um, and as I started to see some of these similarities and got some of the, you know, these doc counts, I started to kind of sort my documents. And a lot of this, a lot of us probably already have this sort. It's, you know, it's how you organize your folder structures. It's maybe how you organize and surface your content. You might want to reach out to if you have like a customer experience team or another team that actually publishes the content um, to see how are they surfacing this and how do your customers actually interact and think about the products and think about your content. Um, because this is where you really start to chunk the content and you look for the reasons why things are the way they are. Um, you wanna look at where are your product families, where are you? We had a lot of overlap in how our operating systems work, even across products and product families. But you know, if it's operating system A, they all function sort of more or less the same way. And that's not necessarily a common way for everybody to think about our products, but it was a great way for us to start looking at where does this content overlap and where can we reuse it? And should those be places that we put in attributes um, based on operating system? And sometimes that worked. Um, and that's, so those were kind of one by one decisions about what felt right to us in terms of how complicated do you want to make the authoring environment? Um, so one of the decisions we made there was at some point I said, you know what, it's okay that these things, these, these topics or these tasks repeat and they, and we have individual topics for tasks that are slightly different because adding another layer of, of metadata on top of that made it just too hard to find and figure out, um, 
and those are I'll be honest, those were decisions that I really worked with my migration vendor with to really figure out where where is there an, an acceptable amount of duplication just for ease of authoring. Um, this was also a place that where we wanted to walk, crawl, and run in that in the first implementation of structured authoring, I said, you know what, I'm okay with not having everything down you know, every instance down to one with a bunch of attributes that it's my team is used to thinking about our content in such a way that if we if we get it down to five from, say, 50 instances, I'm good with that. That's enough until we get comfortable with the system and with this style of authoring. And then you can go back and and, you know, run with that. And, you know, once your team gets comfortable authoring in that style and using the attributes and the metadata to find their content that needs to be edited, then you can go in and always get more reuse out of it. But I opted because brand new implementation, new style, I opted to leave a little bit of the repetition in there um, and keep my and my reuse numbers are a little lower, but not by much. And I'm still getting much more speed in authoring. The other part that you want to look at as you are trying to figure out what your Ferris wheel is going to look like are what tools do you have available. Um, again, Hunter Douglas has been an Adobe shop for quite some time, so all of my content was it is still and was in Adobe InDesign. So that means I need software that works with Adobe InDesign. I need conversion software. I need implementation software that, so that this all is kind of a one-to-one. -one. There isn't a whole lot of, you know, manual labor that needs to go in to clean up the content. Um, we also, another decision that was made before I was hired on was that our CCMS is Adobe Experience Manager. And I absolutely love it. I think it's a robust program that allows me to do as much as I can and want within the Adobe family. And so then the decision of what is your authoring environment going to be? And again, for me, that was a no brainer is Adobe came out with, a, with AEM guides. And that again, integrate seamlessly into AEM and made the content migration from InDesign. We actually wound up going from Adobe PDF into AEM guides pretty clean um, because it's all within the Adobe family and that meant there was no other outside software implementation that I had to um, interface with and custom plugins and all kinds of stuff like that. So you're going to want to look, to keep it simple, you're going to want to look for the authoring tools and the environments and the CCMS that really work well together. And Adobe does have a complete package. So the next thing that we kind of did was, again, looking at, I have all of this content and I started to see where it overlapped. And I started to see where we had some gaps. But if DITA is about putting structure to this and, and labeling things, given a specific framework, I was like, well, I guess I gotta figure out what I call it here today first. And then I can kind of figure out how it connects to DITA, like wh where is it, the same, where's it different? Where do I maybe need to like call this something slightly different? And that's where we went out and we built a taxonomy. Um, there is a whole bunch of content that I could talk about in terms of a taxonomy, um, but I'm just going to really hit the high level on this um, and say that there's all kinds of resources um, with the Society of Technical Communications, uh, the Content Wrangler. There's a lot of work out there about taxonomy. Um, so if you want to go deeper into what is a taxonomy and how do you build it, um, there are other resources for you. But in this case, building a taxonomy was really just about looking at 
how do we currently organize our content? And again, where are our product families? Where are our products? What are our operating systems? What are our design options? What do we call these things? Um, you know, so in more specific, more general terms, it's like, how do we categorize our content? Um, unless you are truly working at a startup and you are the first person they hired and there is just nothing, chances are you have some kind of a loose taxonomy to start from. You have a folder structure. You have, again, how your customer experience team surfaces the documentation to your clients. So there is something there. There's a there's a, a wire frame there that you can start with. And then once you kind of have how those documents are organized, then you can look more narrower and look at within the document, how is that content organized and what is it called? Why is it there? How does it function with what comes before it and what comes after it? Because once you have that in your language, probably with a consultant, you'll be able to look at how do I then apply data to this framework or how do I get this framework to fit into DITA. And that's what you need out of this taxonomy. A lot of times when you look at taxonomy stuff, you're gonna get a lot about tagging and that's great too if you can apply that to your InDesign files um, and then export as XML or as DITA um, from InDesign, that's, an op that's a possibility. For us, we had way too much unstructured kind of chaos going on in our InDesign files because we had all this customization in our products that trying to use the tagging function within InDesign was just way, way too much work and too confusing and having to do that on so many documents and so many pages of content um, was really just not worth our time that there are more effective and efficient ways to do that. The second thing that I would recommend um, looking at is creating an information model. Um, I will also say Dawn Stevens from Comtech is my guru on information models, and I'm gonna give you a high level of what I have learned about that here, um, in that the information model is how you write and how you apply data to your content. So the taxonomy is how do you structure it? And the information model is how do you how do you write it? How do you make data fit into it? And what this means is um, if you have a style guide, you're going to want to bring that in because that's part of the information model. If you have um, any kind of formatting guides, you want to bring that in. That's part of the information model. Um, and even down into the really nitty gritty things like, do you use an Oxford comma? Can you have a single bullet as a list? Can you have an ordered lists? Um, you know, how do you, if it's a, a list in a sentence, do you have the colon at the front? All of these decisions are about how you author the documentation. And they need all of that in the information model because they're gonna use that, and you're gonna use that to create your style sheets so that when you have your taxonomy and your content structure on the application of DITA, what is a heading or what is a bulleted list is how you write it is all in the style sheet to create the output so that you don't have to do the formatting. You don't have to remember all of these things. DITA will do it for you. You can focus on, is my content correct? Is this clearly written? Is this written for the correct function that it's supposed to be fulfilling here? Because you can't finagle the formatting the way you used to. We're, not, we're getting out of the layout business and getting into the authoring business. At this point, you have now heard me say things like, with my consultant, with my vendor, with these people. I did the I did a tax a loose taxonomy and I thought I knew what an information model was and I did a loose information model. And those were both very useful sources that I for me to front load consultants with. But I highly, highly recommend that you hire a migration consultant because these are people that do this for a living. 
and find one that will that can work with you that's within your budget um, because at some point in this I just realized I was way 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 over my head and deep in the weeds and had no idea what direction to go in and my migration consultant really helped sort out everything that I had and where to go next um, Dita is great in that it does have all this customization. The downside is that it has all this customization. And depending on how you use each element or how and how each element can be used will kind of determine, you know, what your output is. So there is sort of the anybody can do Dita, not everybody can do Dita well. And that's where really hiring the professionals to make sure that you do it well for your instance is incredibly highly recommended. Things to consider with a consultant. What's your scope of work? What are their services? How much do they cost? What is their time frame? What is your time frame? Um, and I also have to be honest, there's a likability factor in there too. Do you feel like you can work with them? Migration consultants can also help you find the right tool for the right job. So I originally went into this project process thinking my team knows their content the best. We have, again, a lot of unique content. We have a lot of customized content. We have very customized products. Um, getting up to speed on my team can be really hard because you don't have the product knowledge of why is it like this, sort of like that, why we don't do all of these things. And my migration consultant really looked at me because I was like, okay, but like how, how do I, you know, like really like how do I get it from InDesign into Dita? Like, and I got to be honest, I tried doing it manually. Man, that was like four weeks of a lot of work on my team and didn't get very far. Not because they were slow at copying and pasting, but the application of Dita was all over the place. Some people called it a te text. Some people called it a paragraph. Some people called it a definition term. Some people called it a key term. Some people did this as an ordered list. Some people did this as an unordered list. And I was like, oh my God. Like, and, and then, you know, even at the higher level, some people call it a concept tab a concept topic other people called it a reference topic some people called it a task topic and and we just didn't have the knowledge to understand what are all the true differences between these things and so I kind of brought this up with my migration consultant who um, chuckled at me a little bit and said well you hire a conversion vendor and I said a what now and they said, a conversion vendor. And you go out and and they gave me recommendations of some folks um, to use that, because it's a rep repetitive task, right? You want all of this content into the same form. You know, computers are really, really good at repetitive rote tasks. And so I worked with a migration vendor who took my content, we tried it in InDesign. My InDesign was so unstructured, they were like, okay, we're just gonna stop there. Let's just do it with the PDF, that was cleaner. And with the help of computers and yes, some human oversight to you know, verify and check all these things, but they ran a script on it. And again, having the right tool, non-manually automated, converted my content from InDesign into Tita Topics. Um, that was one of my bigger, yeah, I didn't see that forest through the trees moment. Of course, there's a company that will migrate your content from one form to another. Um, so that was just absolutely invaluable information for me. We already talked a little bit about this. Um, again, cost is a big thing, your timing and the services they provide. So by by hiring a good migration consultant, I also then found out that I needed a conversion consultant or conversion vendor. Um, and, and 
between the two of them, they really helped me explain the differences in what their businesses were. And that allowed me to sell that up the chain of command to my stakeholders. And it's with their help that I actually got my, my, my content migrated. Um, we're looking at wrapping up our project in the next month or so. Um, and getting my team is already starting the training. Thank you to Adobe for your great training on guides and how to author in structured authoring. Um, thank you for joining me here at Ditto World 2023 for how to implement structured authoring. And like I, I just want to leave you with one last thought of you're not alone. There's lots of help out here. The biggest lesson is to really make sure you have the money in your budget to hire some consultants to actually do this work for you because you really need the expert to, real, to know which tool is the best tool for you and how do you actually get your content from A to B. That was the biggest lesson I learned. And um, I have some great consultants that I've been working with and um, met a lot of really great people along the way. So um, a couple of companies to think about. Obviously, Adobe will support you through your entire migration. Um, but I had um, migration consultants such as Precision Contact, content out of Toronto and Comtech right here out of Denver um, and my migration consultants that were really great. I looked at um, Data Conversion Laboratory and Stilo for my conversion consultants. So thank you to all the folks that helped me through this project. Um, and thank you everybody for joining me here at Ditto World 2023. Enjoy the rest of your time here. Thank you. Hello all, thank you for joining me for this session, Harnessing the Power, AM Guides Meets FrameMaker. I'll explain how AM Guides and FrameMaker work together to create a robust data authoring workflow. Before I start, I'd like to introduce you to Sienna. Here's the simple truth. You see all these people out there all over the world, all these billions of humans connected to their network, never stopping to consider what or who makes it all work. Maybe 1% of them are aware that we exist, though nearly all of them benefit from our relentless innovation. We are Sienna, the maker of optical and routing systems, services, and automation software for networks. So what matters most to us? For more than three decades, we've been connecting people to each other and enabling incredible technology experiences while never demanding any time in the spotlight for ourselves. At Sienna, we see things differently, so we build networks differently. We bring humanity to innovation, and we achieve that by putting people first. People are the reason we developed our vision for the adaptive network, because when you bring massive scale and programmability to network infrastructure, real potential gets unleashed. People are also the reason our automation software is built on a principle of openness, allowing our customers to automate and monetize their networks at whatever pace they choose. And people are the reason we invest in relationships, communities, and doing good in the world. Because personal connections and giving back have always led us to great things. To us, there's something quite beautiful about not being known or seen by everyone. The people who need to know about Sienna know, and they include a clear majority of those who build the world's most advanced networks. The responsibility of making it all so seamless and reliable is ours. Dreaming up new ways to connect and communicate is all theirs. We are Sienna. Sienna is a networking system, services, and software company. We have over 8,000 specialists around the globe, and we support approximately 85% of the world's largest service providers. My name is Susanna Carlisi. I am the lead content strategist for Sienna Global Product Documentation. I've worked in TechCom for over 25 years. In recent years, 
my focus has been implementing data authoring and leading the implementation of Adobe Experience Manager guides at Sienna. This timeline shows the history of FrameMaker and AM guides in the Global Product Documentation Group. As you can see, we have been using FrameMaker to develop technical documentation for many years. From 1992 to 2015, unstructured FrameMaker authoring enabled us to meet all our content needs. In 2015, we searched for a new way of authoring to handle customer feedback about uh, consistency and predictability in our content, as well as the evolving need to deliver different types of documentation for different types of users for the same product. We also didn't have an easy way to take content that already existed and reuse it in a different context or product. We chose DITA for its structured and topic-based approach, which aligned with our goals. In 2016, we started on the complex task of converting existing content for thousands of pages. We worked with a consulting firm, The Content Era, to develop conversion prerequisites, requirements, and procedures. In 2017, we rolled out the conversion process, trained our authors, developed best practices for creating brand new content in DITA. In 2018, we moved most of our content authoring to DITA. During this time, I learned how to work with FrameMaker's EDDs and I took over the template and structure development. As some authors embraced uh, the efficiencies that modular topics and reuse enabled, it soon became apparent that uh, managing the explosion in the number of files we were creating and managing reuse effectively required a uh, component content management system or CMS. At the same time, uh, we had to address the future need for content translation. AEM guides addressed these needs perfectly and we rolled it out to our team in 2021. AM Guides extended our solution and uh, provided the team with a way to manage dependencies for effective reuse, manage versions and releases with baselines, and integrate these baselines into the translation workflow. As well, AM Guides supports our selected data authoring tool, FrameMaker. We also developed guidelines for writing our content for translation and integrated a translation management system and the corresponding plugin into AEM guides. So while the shift to DITA provided structure and uh, consistent content organization, uh, as well as reuse capabilities, we now needed a way to have a uniform writing style in our content. So we needed a way to enforce our style guide, uh, check spelling and grammar, uh, increase translatability, and use consistent tone of voice and terminology. So we rolled out a Congre authoring server, which also integrates with FrameMaker. So since rolling out a DIT authoring solution, our team has also increased in size. The documentation team includes 44 specialists distributed across India and North America. The team creates technical customer documentation, which includes publications such as planning guides, user guides, installation guides, and release notes. Here is the agenda for the rest of this session. First, I will describe what the session is about and the target audience. Then I will provide a very quick overview of data authoring in FrameMaker. I will also provide a quick demo. Lastly, I will provide some tips for working efficiently in FrameMaker on content stored in AEM guides. I will also provide a demo of these tips. This session focuses on the FrameMaker and AEM Guides integration features that Sienna authors use to avoid errors and optimize their workflow. This session is intended for teams already using FrameMaker and who are considering or are in the process of evaluating AEM Guides to extend their solution and to unlock efficiencies not available without a CCMS. Specifically, this session is for teams who want to continue to use FrameMaker as an authoring tool either as a primary editor or as an optional editor, giving the authors the choice between the AEM Guides editor or FrameMaker. 
I will also provide a very high level overview of the basics of data authoring in FrameMaker. My intent is to provide some context for those who are authoring in unstructured FrameMaker and want to see what data authoring looks like in FrameMaker. Even if you are using unstructured FrameMaker today and plan to move to authoring in the AM Guides web editor, you can still use FrameMaker to dabble in data authoring so that you can learn about data prior to the AEM Guides implementation. I will now provide a quick overview of data authoring in FrameMaker. First, I just want to touch on some of the reasons we continue to use FrameMaker at Siena. The FrameMaker environment was familiar, so it made moving to data easier and a little bit less intimidating. Also, we were building on an existing investment. We could use the structured mode of FrameMaker at no additional cost. Writers will continue to use unstructured FrameMaker anyway to either maintain existing unstructured documentation that is in the queue for conversion or author legacy content that is reaching end of life. Lastly, with FrameMaker, you can continue to publish in a similar way. So before you can start authoring data content in FrameMaker, make sure that the product interface is set to structured FrameMaker. Also, select the data version that you want to use. I've provided information here on how to open these dialogues. Those are the most basic steps that you will have to perform to set up for data authoring in FrameMaker. If your team wants to constrain the elements available for authors to use, or if your application includes some customizations, you will need to perform additional steps to configure these differences. But out of the box, you can use FrameMaker to author in data, in data after making these two selections. Then you can create a topic, usually a task, concept, or reference topic, either by choosing the topic type from the file menu or by clicking on the topic type in the FrameMaker welcome screen. DITA is based on modular topic-based authoring, so you can create content in discrete topics, each meant to answer a single question such as, for example, how do I install something? What are the benefits of a certain feature? Or what are the technical specifications of this product? A task might provide the steps for completing a procedure using the product. A concept might describe the different configurations a product supports. So you need to understand this information before you can perform related procedures. A reference topic might list hardware technical specifications. Reference topics are usually not read word for word, but referenced when needed. In general, in most cases, the topics are written to support the tasks and content is task focused, but this depends on the type of content you are authoring. Once you have created and saved your topics, you assemble the topics into a deliverable using a map. You create the map from the file menu or the welcome screen in the same way you created a topic. You save the map with a file name with lowercase letters and numbers. You can use the underscore or hyphen character, but no spaces or other special characters. Here, I want to emphasize the difference between DITA and unstructured authoring. Instead of creating a handful of large chapters for a book, with DITA topic-based authoring, you create a large collection of topics. Then you build publications by choosing topics from the collection and assembling them in a map in different combinations to create distinct user-focused content. You can reuse topics easily in this way. DITA eliminates the need to manually reformat a reused topic that is included in different positions in the map hierarchy of multiple maps. Formatting of content in the output based on hierarchy is automatically handled during publishing. That means that you aren't retagging reused topics manually with a specific heading level to set hierarchy. Instead, you use each map to arrange the topics in the required hierarchy and all the formatting is done automatically at publish time. At Siena, we refer to published maps as main maps and these main maps are made up of, of smaller submaps organized by feature, module, or task-focused unit, a set of topics organized by function. 
So in this example, I'm demonstrating how the hierarchy is set in a published deliverable. Here, I'm showing four distinct topics that reside in separate files. And at the bottom of this slide, I'm showing how these topics are organized in the data map. So the first topic is at the first level, and the remaining three topics are nested in one level from the first topic. This is how that data map publishes to PDF. As you can see, the first topic is at a higher level than the topic that was nested in one level in the map. When you author topics, you aren't setting the hierarchy inside of the individual topic. Instead, you set the hierarchy using the map. Therefore, when you are writing a topic, you're really focusing on creating the content for that topic. When working in structure, you are typically adding content using the document view, and you work on the structure of the document using the structure view. The structure view shows the underlying structure of the topic, and the document view works in a similar way to the document view in Unstructured FrameMaker. You also use the Elements panel and the Attributes panel to select and adjust elements and attributes. Elements are the building blocks of, of a structured document, and attributes are the properties associated with an element. Some elements contain only other elements for the purpose of setting the hierarchy, and some elements contain text. Here, the DL entry element definition list entry is a container for the DT and the DD elements. The definition term and definition description. In this example, the list of attributes is shown for the P element. The attributes panel, which is used to specify the attributes, isn't shown here but I'll show it in the demo. You also have options for expanding and collapsing elements and the list of attributes using the arrows on the left and right sides of the element. As you move the mouse around the structure view, the cursor type changes to indicate the actions available at each location. The current insertion point is also displayed in the structure view. Once you master using the structure view to build the document structure, you will be able to set up topics very quickly. In FrameMaker, you can work in a WYSIWYG view or the XML view. The XML view shows the data source. As you can see, the data tags indicate what the content is rather than how it looks. For example, you won't see tags such as H1, H2, and so on. Instead, you see a title tag. How that title appears when published depends on the location of this topic in the context of the overall map. Now, I will show a short demo of data authoring in FrameMaker. First, I will create a topic from the welcome screen I'll select a reference topic. You will see that the structure view appears and it contains some elements or auto insertions by default. We configured these auto insertions to build a structure that we consider the most useful starting point for a reference. I will insert another section element by placing the insertion point and then clicking and selecting section in the elements panel. I can either double click on section or click once and click the insert button. When I click on different locations in the structure view, you will notice in the elements panel that the list of elements changes. This is because Structured authoring is guided authoring, and you are presented with only those elements that are valid at the current location. These lines in the structure view clarify the element hierarchy. 
I will also show how you can use the structure view to set the insertion point for adding content or another element. If I click to the right of the short desk element, I can add text because text is valid here. This is a block element, which is similar to a paragraph in unstructured content. It has text, which I'll type in. If I click inside this short description, we can see the elements that are valid here. These are inline elements. They're in line with this element. I'll insert a trademark. Now you'll notice that I was prompted for an attribute, the TM type attribute. So I can click and select a value here. I will select the register trademark. If I look at the structure view, you'll see that the attribute appears under the element. If I need to change it, I can double click to open the attributes panel. Now let's switch to a topic that contains more content so I can show additional items. You can drag and drop content using the structure view. Now notice what happens when I hover at this location. You'll see the red outline. That means that if I drop the element here, it won't be valid. So I need to keep going until I can drop it at a valid location. And you can tell by the check mark next to the element name. You can also unwrap elements. Unwrapping is easier to explain using an example. Here, I decide that I want to remove the italics. Italics on its own is a formatting tag, so I try to minimize any formatting specific type tags. Sometimes they're useful, but I don't think it's needed here. So I will need to unwrap this italic element. Now I can't just simply delete it because that will delete the text too. Instead, I just want to remove the outer layer from the text, just like unwrapping candy. You wanna keep the good stuff on the inside. So I right click and select unwrap. You can also wrap text or wrap content in another element. So what I'll do here is instead of having this text directly in the DD element, definition description, I will have two paragraphs. So I'll select the first sentence and I will wrap this in a P element. Select P and then I'll select the wrap button. And I will do the same for the second sentence. I have some white space here, which I can just delete. Note that FrameMaker also includes a structured access toolbar. This toolbar allows you to quickly view panels for structured authoring and perform common functions such as validating topics. I'll click Start Validating, and this message tells me that my document is valid. You should always validate your work after making changes to a topic. 
Now I will review some tips for working with FrameMaker and AEM guides. Specifically, I will review how we work with FrameMaker and AEM at Siena. I will just start with some background or setup information about configuring the connection to AEM guides from FrameMaker. Before you can connect an AEM repository, you need to set up the connection in the Connection Manager dialog. Some of the fields here require no explanation, such as the server address, username, and password. I will go into more detail on the name and local folder fields shortly, but for now, I will mention that if you connect to several AEM servers, make sure that the name you choose allows you to distinguish between each AEM server. Note that there are two ways to open or check out files stored in AEM guides. You can use the FrameMaker Repository Manager panel, which is shown on the left, or in AEM guides, you can select the file and then click on Open in FrameMaker. Using either of these methods, you edit the file in FrameMaker. What's important to understand is that when you open or check out a topic stored in AEM using FrameMaker, FrameMaker retrieves the topic from the AEM repository and downloads it to a location on your local drive. If you have checked the file out, you edit the file locally. Any changes you make are only uploaded back to the AEM server when you check the file back in. The download location on your local computer is known as the local folder. Most of the time, you are not exposed to the local folder directly. If you open a data map in FrameMaker, all references of the map, including other referenced maps, topics, and graphics are downloaded to the FrameMaker local folder automatically by default. Therefore, you don't need to manually track which files and folders are referenced in a data map. AEM Guides automatically keeps track of all dependencies. This is a huge advantage of using a CCMS over a CMS. Tip number one, use the auto checkout options. You can configure auto checkout options in FrameMaker to automatically check out files you open from the repository manager or from AEM Guides Open in FrameMaker button. Just to clarify, a file that is checked in to AEM Guides is locked and can't be modified. When you want to work on a file, you check it out to set a lock on it so that no one else can modify the file while you're working on it. At Siena, we configure the CMS and auto checkout options as follows. Upon opening a file that's stored in AEM using FrameMaker, a prompt appears that allows the author to choose whether or not to check out the file. Setting the CMS options, as I have shown here, saves us time. This is because we eliminate the extra step of closing or opening the file each time we check in or check out. Setting the auto checkout options, as I have shown here, also saves us time because we eliminate the extra step of checking out a file separately from the step of opening the file. Why this matters? Most importantly, enabling show prompt prevented authors from working on a locked file. Before auto checkout was available, writers often opened files stored on the repository and forgot to check them out, only to discover that another writer changed the file while they were editing a locked version. Tip number two, know what the FrameMaker local folder is and how it works. This slide describes where FrameMaker downloads files from AEM to your local computer. When you set up the connection to AEM from the Connection Manager dialog, you must enter a local folder and a connection name. It's important to understand that what you specify for these two fields affects where files are downloaded to your hard drive from AEM. You can see at the bottom of the slide that the path to the downloaded files on your computer starts with the local folder, followed by the connection name, followed by content DAM, which is the location where assets are stored on the AM server, followed by a language folder, if you have set up a translation workflow.
and the rest of the path that maps to how the folder hierarchy of your files exists in AEM. Why this matters. So why do you need to know this if you are usually not directly exposed to the files in the local folder? Because you need to be aware that you should not change the configured local folder and connection name for an already configured connection, especially if you have any files that are checked out. If you have files checked out and you change the location of the local folder, you might overwrite updates you made and the updated files will be abandoned in the previous local folder location. I will now review details of how the local folder works. This slide will be a bit text heavy, but these points are important to understand. For file downloads, when you open or check out a file stored in AEM using FrameMaker, FrameMaker retrieves the topic and by default, its dependents and stores them in the local folder. What to note here is that FrameMaker downloads the files it needs to ensure that references resolve. So that includes conrefs, graphics, links. This is the default behavior. I'll talk to exceptions and options a bit later. When you check a file back in, the local updated copy is uploaded back to AEM and the file is abandoned in the local folder until you check it out again, at which time the file is, if modified, overwritten with a fresh version from AEM. Depending on how you check in, sometimes the file is left in the local folder and sometimes it is removed. That's okay, the file is checked in and you have to check it out again anyway if you want to edit it. If you check a file out with FrameMaker, you must check the file back in with FrameMaker. It's really important to know that if you check out the file in FrameMaker and then click the check-in button in the AM web UI, the web UI does not fetch the file from your local folder. So if you do this, the file that is checked in using the web UI is exactly the same as the file you checked out. If you use FrameMaker to author content, check-in and check-out is done in FrameMaker. The open in FrameMaker uh, button in the AM web UI is used to initiate, initiate opening the file in FrameMaker, but the checkout is actually done in FrameMaker. If you have a file open already and then you check out the same file, a new copy is not downloaded over the existing file. This is actually an advantage in, case, in the case where you have started to modify a topic without checking it out first. I will talk about this a little bit later. Moving and deleting files. If you delete the contents of the local folder without checking in files, you lose that work. You might be able to recover the files from the recycle bin. Moving files from the AEM web UI does not move them in the local folder. There's no direct sync between uh, the AEM server and the local folder. The only time FrameMaker downloads files to your computer is when you open or check out a file. So when you move a file in the AEM web UI, this could result in a situation where you have two files with the same name in different places the file before moving and the file after moving. Only the file after moving will contain the most up-to-date information. This is not a problem because the local folder is not meant to be a complete um, accurate copy of the file stored on the AEM server. It's more of a scratch pad. So you just need to keep this in mind if you're browsing local folders. We ask our authors to clear the local folder periodically after ensuring that they have no checked out files. Create new files. When you create new topics or maps, you can create them in the local folder, in a folder that corresponds to the folder that exists in the hierarchy. Upload new files immediately after you create them so that you don't forget to do so later. This is a best practice we follow for creating an individual file. 
that is to upload it as soon as you create it and then check it out and add content. If the local folder does not exist, create it and um, you can create it in the parent folder where it will exist once you upload it to the repository. Then upload the entire folder at once. This is a best practice when you're creating a number of files that will be stored in a new folder in the repository. Tip number three, remember to check out a file that you want to mod modify. Because authors might be used to working in FrameMaker alone, they sometimes accidentally open and edit topic files from a checked out data map. When you check out a data map, topic files in that map are not checked out. Authors realize that the topic file is locked only when they can't save it. However, if they keep the file open in the FrameMaker document view and only after ensuring that no one else has modified the file, they can still perform the checkout from the repository manager without losing the changes. The key here is to have the file open while you perform that checkout. Why this matters. Authors who are used to working in FrameMaker alone might be more likely to do this. Providing an explicit reminder of how checkouts work will prevent errors. Tip number four, to edit only the Didamap file, use the one level dependence resolution option. As I mentioned before, when you open or check out any file from Repository Manager, FrameMaker will download all of the files dependence by default. You can change the default behavior to control what is downloaded using dependence resolution options. This is the guidance we provide to our authors. If you need to make a change to the Didamap file only, for example, to change an attribute in the Didamap file, use one level dependence resolution. In any other case, especially when publishing through FrameMaker, choose multi-level dependence resolution. Why this matters? Limiting the download to first level dependence saves time. Here's an example. For the data map shown on the left, select dependence resolution one level to download the main map and sub maps included in the main map. Select dependence resolution multi-level to download the main map, the submaps in the main map, as well as the topic files, the graphics, and all other reference content in the submaps. Tip number five, add more favorites. The add folder to favorites option in the repository manager panel allows authors to configure their favorite folders. Our authors use this option to navigate directly to the folder containing submaps or topics. Um, the configured favorites, you can identify them, they're the ones that have the pushpin. The list also shows the recent files below the favorites. The configured default of five favorites proved too restrictive and frustrating, especially with topic-based authoring. Luckily, you can increase the number of favorites that appear in the list by updating the maker.ini file. To avoid modifying the FrameMaker installation folder, you can make these changes in the maker.ini file that is included in the user directory. Why this matters? Navigating through every folder in the FrameMaker repository manager can be time consuming and jumping to your favorites saves you time. Tip number six, reuse with ease. Check file properties in the AM Guides web UI. It's easy to lose track of the impact that making updates to reuse content has on your content products. Implementing best practices reduces these issues. For example, creating confs for content that can be used in any context. 
However, it's still important to track where common content is referenced, especially when reusing topics. From the FrameMaker Repository Manager, you can easily jump to the AEM web UI um, with a specific file in view and then open that file's properties. The AEM Guide's Properties window lists all the references for a file, so you can see where that file is used. Why this matters? Ignoring the impact of changes to shared content can decrease the accuracy of your documentation. Okay, now I will show a short demo of working with FrameMaker and AEM Guides. So I have already connected to the AEM Guides repository and you can see the file stored in AEM Guides for the configured connection, AEM Production ADW. Remember that this connection name is configured when setting up the connection. I have the auto checkout options configured to automatically check out a file upon open and to show a prompt. I also configured the CMS options to open a file upon checkout and close it on check-in. I will use my configured favorites list to quickly navigate to one of the topics included in our style guide. And note, you can see here that I have more than the default of five favorites. I have configured 10 favorites. I will double click to open this file. And this message box prompts me to confirm the checkout. So I'll click yes. The console indicates that the auto checkout was successful. I need to refresh this folder to view a green check mark which indicates that I have checked out the file. Remember, this file was downloaded to my local computer and the edits I make are going to be saved locally. I can see this file in my local folder by right clicking and selecting explore. Now, if I open or check out a data map, all the dependents of that data map are also copied to my local folder so that all of the references resolve. I'll check out the data map that contains this topic that's in view. If I view the contents of the local folder again, now you can see that all of the other remaining topic files from that data map also appear in this local folder. That's because all of the maps references are downloaded when I check out the map. Going back to my data map, I open this file from the data map, and if I start to edit it, I can do so. But this topic is not checked out. When I try to save the file, I get this message stating that it can't open the file for writing. That's because the file isn't checked out. Remember, checking out a data map does not check out its dependence unless you explicitly use the check out with dependence option. I don't need to discard my changes when I make this mistake. What I do need to do is first make sure that no one modified this file while I was working on it and I can do this by checking the version history of the file in the AEM web UI. Then 
I check out the file while it is still open in FrameMaker. Because the file is open, the version that is on the AM server is not copied to the local folder, which is good because I don't want to lose the change that I made. Now I can change, I can make more changes or save the file and check the file back in. Finally, I'd like to show how to check where content is reused. Again, I will use my favorites list and navigate to my common folder. I'll navigate to a file. And I can check where this topic is being used by first right-clicking, selecting Open on Server. This opens the file in AEM Guides, and then clicking Properties. I can see that this file is reused in two maps. Also, in additional topics. It's referenced in the topics and reused in these two maps. That's the end of this session. Thank you for attending and I hope you enjoy the rest of this year's Adobe Diddle World. Thank you also to Adobe for having me back as a presenter this year again. Hello everyone and welcome to the day two of Adobe Data World 2023. My name is Vishal Gupta and I represent Adobe Experience Manager Guides as a solutions expert at Adobe. I'm passionate about technology, products and content strategies and it's been almost a decade now working with multiple products including the Experience Manager platform and modules like AEM Sites, Forms, Assets, Guides, and others, all aimed at maximizing your content supply chain model. And today I'm here to announce the latest feature of AEM Guides, or shall I say, the automation of your brand and marketing content directly from the authoring interface of AEM Guides. In this session, we are going to witness how Guides empowers you to convert your structured content into digital experiences which can seamlessly be delivered across touch points. Well, I'm thrilled to talk about this automation in the AEM ecosystem and demonstrate it live in the next few minutes. So let's start with it. One of the most frequent conversation that we keep having internally as well as externally is how organizations can scale the delivery of their products and brands for different audiences and portfolios for better customer engagement and consistent experience across the different channels. Consistently conveying our message helps create brand awareness and recognition among the potential customers. Based on these customer insights, our marketing team creates strategies to reach and engage with our customers more effectively. Most of the organizations fall into the two buckets that you see here on your screen. Some of them are still following the traditional conventions of creating and delivering the content to their end users in an inconsistent manner. On the other hand, many have moved to a more professional solution such as Experience Manager platform, having specialized modules like AEM Sites, which is a web content management system. 
AEM assets, which itself is a state-of-the-art digital asset management solution. And cherry on the top is the native integration of Experience Manager platform with all the Adobe products that are needed when it comes to content and creativity. AEM Guides or the CCMS module of your Experience Manager platform provides more granular control on your structured content and has become the choice of your marketers, authors, and collaborators to deliver seamless customer experience with personalized content and building better customer engagement that actually leads to more conversions. And you cannot ignore the fact that data and structured authoring helps increase content velocity. Let's take a look under the hood and see how Experience Manager Guides is positioned in the AEM ecosystem. As we already know, Guides or your CCMS module is where you author and manage all of your content, be it technical or marketing content. And it actually resides or stored in our DAM, which is AEM assets. And you can deliver this content to multiple output channels, including the native integration with AEM sites, which is our web CMS. So far, the marketers were creating their structured and unstructured content using content fragments and experience fragments in AEM sites. And today in this session, we are going to see how you can automate the creation of these fragments directly from the guides interface and deliver them as ready to use fragments in AEM sites. I'm sure everybody is excited to see this. So let's get live into action. Uh, let's first take a look to our own Adobe's website, business.adobe.com. And specifically here, I want to talk about the Experience Manager platform itself. And let's take a look to our Experience Manager homepage or our product page. It lists all the Experience Manager or AEM modules and capabilities. And if we open each of these pages, we see the individual site pages that has content or marketing content specific to these products or these modules. Like in AEM site page, we can see that there is a hero image in the star and then there is some images and uh, some content in a different layout and following on with more content. And if we move on to the assets page, it looks similar to that. And we have the similar look and feel and layout here as well. Let's take a look to the third module of our interest, which is AEM Guides. So if I switch to the Guides page, here you see, again, we have the hero image with a welcome note to Data World that's going live today. But the content layout or the page layout is slightly different from the other AEM module pages here because AEM Guides is an authoring platform or your authoring interface wherein a lot of capabilities are there. So we have segregated all of these individual, you know, capabilities in the form of segments, following on with a lot of more information on this page. But let's do a role play here. And I'll be your marketer today in this session. And let's say my management wants me to create a website similar to business.adobe.com for our experience manager product profile. And I want to bring all of these marketing content together and I have to publish this content into a site page. So I, as you can see that we already have some content here, so we can just reuse uh, this content and let's create a site page. We all are aware that this is not a one-man show. So obviously me as a marketer, I'm not working alone. I have a content team. Uh, my authors are already creating this content. Let us assume that. And let's say that they have already created all of this content for me and I'll just be using the existing content or reuse the existing content to create and manage my site pages. So let's see how that will work. So we are here on our AEM homepage and you can see all the modules here. We have our CCMS or our authoring interface where we'll be authoring the content and managing the publishing of this content, which will be published onto our site page. And we will convert all of this content that is our data or structured content, we'll convert them as ready to use fragments and we will pull those fragments onto the site page. This will actually reduce, you know, the effort or the time that goes into creating and managing those components individually, finding that component and creating our site page altogether. And it is all stored in the assets or our DAM itself. So let's say as a marketer, I know that I have a lot of content that exists in my DAM, 
but how do I find the relevant content that is for my experience manager portfolio? So let's just go and see how I'm going to find the content. So I'm going into the advanced filters and you can see that there are almost thousand content pieces, including the multimedia, my PDFs, images, videos, and whatnot, my P uh, PDFs and other type of content all together. So I have a count of around thousand here, but I want to find all the content that has been approved for publishing and it is related to my experience manager product portfolio and the modules that we have talked about, sites, assets, and guides. So first, let me apply a filter and see the approved content that I have in my dam. So you can see from almost 1,000, my count has gone down to 200 now. And I have all of this content appearing as approved content and the status of the document as well. So I have a lot of learning content here as well because we can also author our learning materials here that can directly be pulled onto our site pages. So out of these 200 plus content, I'm not interested in all of that, but I just want to find the content that is related to my experience cloud portfolio. And I have some taxonomies here which I have tagged with my content or my authors while creating the content, they have tagged it to make it easier for other users and marketers like me to find the relevant content. So I can find content that relates to AEM sites or assets or guides or all together, all of my experience cloud related content. And let's see, the content count has gone down to 27 now. And I have my data content, my structured content, and you can see the document state also is showing as reviewed. So that means all my site page, asset page content, or generative AI content, all of this content is reviewed by my content reviewers and people who are involved in creation of this entire content. And this has also been approved for publishing. So I have my data content. I have my multimedia also, right? If I want to further filter out and see only my multimedia content, I can again put a filter more to on the file type and find only my images that will make the count go further down to 15. But let's not just do that. And uh, now I have all the content related to experience cloud. How do I go ahead with this? So I can directly, as a marketer, take a look and open the editors, editor mode directly from here. So I can edit the content directly and it will bring me here to our guides interface or our authoring interface, wherein you can see that by default, I have landed into my author's mode. And then there is a preview mode also that shows us how the content will look like when it is published onto a site page. So I can switch to the preview mode and take a look how my published content will appear on the site page. So this is my AEM sites content. It has some content, it has heading, it has images, it has some bulleted list, and then further on. So I can make changes to this content by simply click clicking, right clicking. Oh, let me switch back to the author's mode and I can simply make edits as we do in Word. So we have capped the authoring similar to how we perform our edits and author the content in Microsoft Word. So you simply go ahead, make changes to your content, typing new content, and there you go. So you can save your changes, but right now we are not going to do that as it is already been reviewed and approved by my team. So I'll just close that. And you can see that I have my favorite list so that I don't need to perform a search here in my authoring interface also. So if I directly land on to my AEM guides UI or interface, I can switch to my favorites list. And in my favorite list, I have mapped all these individual components, or I can say content pieces together that relates to my experience manager product portfolio. Let's take a look to all these individual components together in the preview mode. And I'm switching back to preview mode here. So here you can see 
that my home page of cloud products has some video content also it has some url also i have some headings i have my assets content with images with hyperlinks this could be internal as well as external hyperlink and then finally we have our guides content and in guides content you can see that we also have some tab tabular content here so you can have all different type of content and structure within your same content so every content piece every content that we see here is an individual content and it can have a different layout a different structure and all you are doing is authoring that content similar like you're doing it in word so you author the content you type your content make your changes it could be in different layout for every individual content section and you have stitched it together so that you don't have to perform the search for individual content pieces and all of your experience manager related content can be published all together using this map so even if you want to see or find where this content actually resides in your dam you can go to locate in your repository and it will show you the exact place where this content resides but right now what we are doing is that we already have the content reviewed and approved i'll just simply switch to the dashboard so that i can trigger the publishing here we are and we have a lot of output presets but my interest is to convert all of this structured content these individual content pieces that are having different layout and structure and i want to convert all of these content pieces into experience fragments and i want to publish all of these experience fragments or components to this particular path in my content in my experience fragment and this is the folder where i'm publishing this content so let's just do that and in order to publish this content and convert them as experience fragment all i need to do is click on generate and the moment i click on generate i can simply switch to outputs and you can see that it take hardly five seconds to publish all of my content and convert that into experience fragment so you can see that uh, we have a success rate here so let's just take a look and switch to our home page again and i'm now navigating into experience fragment and let's take a look that how this individual content pieces that we have seen here are appearing in the experience fragments so you can see in experience fragment the destination path was technical content and here in this folder you can see i have a lot of experience fragments going on but again the question is as a marketer how do i find the right content because it's very difficult when this content you know this set of content grows so in order to do that if i if you already know then you can simply go ahead and take a look or what i prefer doing is i have my metadata here also and based on the metadata i can perform the search and i want to find the content that relates to a particular product profile i can search for all the experience fragments for experience cloud or i can find my experience fragments for aem sites so let's sorry let me just go back and perform the search once again so i'm going here and experience fragments and let me just perform the search once again and let's find the content related to aem assets so all the experience fragments that are related to aem assets or our dam are here so i have my dam related short summary i have my assets page with image and content and related to gen ai so let's take a look and i want to view my experience fragment so you can see that the content we were seeing in the authoring interface let me switch here so here is our assets page it has my heading my paragraph images and some bulleted list and all so this structured content or data content is converted into a ready to use experience fragment with just one click right so we are in the edit mode obviously it is possible to make a change here in the edit mode as well but the whole point of using a ccms is to have a unified 
strategy of managing your content. So all of the edit and modifications are done in the source, which is our CCMS module, our authoring environment, and we are just publishing them and using them as ready to use fragments. You can switch to preview mode, you can make edits, you can do whatever you want. So this is how we are searching our experience fragments, taking a look before publishing them live into our website. So this is how we are performing the search in experience fragment. We have taken a look and now let's go into the sites page. So I have all my experience fragments published there in the destination that we have seen. And now let's take a look onto a site page. And here is a site page, experience page, wherein I have created all these experience module pages, like for assets, for guides, for sites, for forms, cloud service, and a cloud page as well. So all of these content pieces, my site pages I've created, but I have not changed all the other pages. So we can just uh, ignore the rest of the pages and focus on these pages that are within the experience homepage. So I'll just open or let's just take a look to an individual page. And let me open the AEM assets or AEM sites page for you. So if I edit this page, here it is. We are in the sites page and we have the hero image. We have the heading appearing here with the content, which is our experience fragment now. And then I have already mapped my image and my content here, and I've designed this layout here for my site page. Similarly, I have designed the layout for all the pages of my experience platform. So in order to do that, let me just go out of the edit mode and let's switch to the content mode or to the publish mode. So let's take a look as how it will appear as a website. So now we are out of the edit mode. You can see here, we can see all the navigations in our experience page. We have our sites page, we have our assets page, guides page, and other pages. So let's switch or let us perform a search first and let's see if the search is actually working when my content is coming from the authoring or CCMS module. So if I want to perform a search and I'm searching for CCMS, it is giving me experience manager guides page and if I click here, this will open the guides page. So we have the guides page. We have all of our guides content with the table that we were looking at. And also there is a downloadable PDF that is again coming from our authoring interface. You can take a look by downloading this PDF, which is again authored in your CCMS itself. So we'll come to that later. Let's just see how our search is working. So yeah, it is good. The search is working fine. Let's take a look to our asset space as well. So here, let's just take a look. And yeah, I have the same layout. So this looks pretty promising as what we were expecting. Almost similar to what we have in business Adobe site, right? So now I have all of my individual pages for assets, sites, and guides ready. But I have to create a home page also, or like let's just take a look to the experience page, the home page here. So here we are in the Data World 2023, the session of AEM guides, and we have all of our pages appearing here. We have taken a look to our guides page, sites page, and assets page, all working fine with the content that is directly coming from our authoring interface. But now let's take a look onto a page where I have kept it blank for now. And I want to do that live in this session. So I have to switch to the edit mode back. So I'm doing that. Let's switch back to the editors mode on this page. And right now you can see that we only have a hero image here, but we do not have any content appearing here. And now on this page, I don't want to just pull one content. I want to pull all the content together in a different layout, which is going to be my home page of my experience cloud. So let's say I can create a different experience fragment 
And in that experience fragment, I have already done the mappings. So we have taken a look to individual experience fragments here, but I've created a product page here itself as an experience fragment, wherein there are mappings that I've created and we'll come to that, how I've created those mapping. So let's just simply pick the content and see how this experience fragment is appearing to me. So this is one experience fragment. And in this one experience fragment, I have tied all of the content together that was there in my data map. And I have designed this layout of this experience fragment, wherein I have my initial cloud product information. I have my video coming here. I have my capabilities, like we are talking about the DAM, a CMS, our CCMS part, and then individual modules also. I have the information of individual modules appearing one by one for assets, for sites, and for guides. And then we have seen how I have pulled these content pieces individually on these site pages for, that I have designed for these individual pages of the modules, right? So we can do that and let's switch back now as we have already made the change, let's switch back to the sites mode and let's take a look how this content will appear when it is published. So we are now here in the publish mode and we can see all the navigations working fine. Let's just try switching to another site page. So we are going on to the site page. Here you see only sites related content is appearing. We have but if I go back to my cloud page, wherein we have just now added a freshly designed experience fragment that is already covering all the different modules together, as well as the individual content pieces also in a new layout. So this is an entire page designed as an experience fragment, wherein we have mapped all the experience fragments together. Let's try to run this video and see that if we are using or creating our videos and storing them, or maybe this is a YouTube link. So it is an embedded video that I'm using from our summit. So if we are using those videos, authoring those videos, having those videos in our CCMS and bringing them onto the site page, how is the experience for the end users? So I'm going to play this video for a few seconds and let's take, take a look. Welcome to Adobe Summit, everybody. It's awesome to feel the energy in this room. And yeah, it looks good. And it also shows me more videos that are related to this video that I'm playing. I can simply click for to a more video link and it will open the YouTube link also for me. So this all works fine. Even my share button works. So I can share onto my social page or I can go back to the YouTube mode. I can do all of that. So yes, our videos are playing very well. Even our images are appearing nicely here. We have our URLs also linked. So even if it is an external URL, so you can see that I have linked it back to the AEM sites or this is AEM assets page, right? So we have linked it back to an external page. We have our PDF also. So let's try and see how the PDFs are appearing. So even the download of the PDF are working fine in this environment. And these PDFs are actually created in your authoring interface itself. So let's just take a look and I'll go back to the authoring interface now. And in my authoring interface, let me close all of this. So here we are back to the preview mode and now I am in my authors mode. There is a option of output here wherein you can create your custom pre presets for your PDFs. You can design them and generate those PDFs. So let's just take a look and generate the PDF. And if I generate the PDF live here, 
we can see the generation is taking part here. So let's just take a pause. Or I have already generated the PDF here. So here we are. The Adobe Data World content that we were looking at, our AEM product portfolio, all the pages and content that was there in our CCMS is now available to us in the form of PDF as well. So it's pretty straightforward. You can directly manage all of your structured content. It's already generated. You can manage all of your structured content directly from within your authoring interface, similar to what you were doing in Word, and then convert that content into experience fragment, use those experience fragments, and create your own custom experience fragment the way you want to design the layout. And it saves all of my time as a marketer. I can simply find existing content. I can reuse any content that exists into my DAM and reuse that to create fragments and publish them into my site pages. So, and let's now switch back to our last part of the session. You now have more granular control on your marketing content as well as technical content. So AEM Guys does not only support your technical documentation, it also helps you to scale your marketing content by converting your structured content into fragments and publish them directly onto your site page. We already have a lot of other features in AEM Guys as a marketer, and you're able to use these experience fragments from your structured content and create your marketing strategies much easier, much faster. This will definitely help us to improve our content strategies, our marketing strategies, and provide consistent and cohesive experience across the different channels that we have. And for those who are interested in having a you know, personal session, you can reach out to me. If in case you have some queries, you can reach out to me on email with your queries. I'll be happy to answer them. And thank you so much for your valuable time. Thank you. Hey everybody, welcome to Adobe Digital World. My name is Bernard Ashwanden. A quick thank you to Stefan Gentz and everybody at Adobe for organizing this and of course to you for attending. If you happen to have your phone, feel free to pull it out, get your camera ready. The QR code in the top left is to my LinkedIn page. The QR code in the bottom right is to our webpage where you can sign up for a demo. You can actually get a chance to see some of the things in regards to AEM guides using your content in our environment. So do feel free to reach out. Doing my job, my name is Bernard Ashwanen. I am the EVP of Business Development at Precision Content in Canada. And I think the rest of the information on the slides pretty much speak for themselves, so we'll move ahead. Part of my job is to go out and talk to clients and prospective clients and find out how is it that they're actually creating content now. I usually ask questions like, where are you? Where do you want to be? Why aren't you there yet? And how can we help get you there? So in regards to working with AEM guides and some of the productivity challenges that I hear from people, I thought I'd put together something that really quickly goes through and showcases a couple of things that I like to do when I'm working with and helping people work with AEM guides. My initial thought for the first couple of slides was to go in and build content and put everything together. And then I thought, hey, there's a lot of talk about ChatGPT. I've been using it for over a year now. Why don't I ask it to take my outline, my information, and come back with something interesting? And it did. I fed it a prompt, you can see that on the left, based on some information that I had. And it came back with common tasks in regards to building a log home and also when creating technical documentation. So let me go in and talk to these for a moment. And instead of just showing you the slide with the tasks, building the home, creating tech docs, I'm going to work my way through it conversationally, but I'll give you something more interesting to look at. That has a nice sunset view. That's actually off of our balcony area. And then you can see the shoreline, the original view of the trees once we thinned it out a little bit, putting in a foundation and starting to build what we had. Well, that's planning the structure. In the log home we went through, we did some design layout. And in the tech com world, you would define the structure and organization of your technical documentation. You have that plan. We had to scope materials, select appropriate logs, and all of the building material for the house, the siding, the roof. 
In the same way, you want to identify all of the required materials, the content, the resources that are going to be required to work with your documentation. We had to come up with budgets. We had to estimate costs of the home project in the same way that if you're dealing with tech docs, you have to allocate resources and plan your budget. Here, meeting with stakeholders. You can actually see the documentation right there, the blueprints. Interacting with subject matter experts. Doing on-site visits making sure that we're monitoring what's happening, keeping everyone informed. In regards to the log home, that meant collaborating with architects, contractors, construction workers, experts in plumbing, experts in electrical and masonry, checking on the progress, making sure that things were being done at the speed that we expected and making sure that we kept everybody involved in the conversation. If we look at that from documentation and that structured workflow in the CCMS, you want to talk to your subject matter experts, your stakeholders, your reviewers, you want to get input and expertise from technical experts and content contributors and consultants. You want to make sure that you adhere to the documentation workflow. You review the drafts, you monitor the progress. And again, everybody stays informed along the way. And then you execute to the plan. In our case, we want to build the home according to the plan. We knew what we wanted at the end. In documentation, you'd want to follow the structured workflow so that you create and review and publish all of your documentation. We make sure that content finds the right home, either placing and organizing the furniture inside the home or any of the components of the house. In the same way for documentation, you would apply metadata and taxonomy so that you have that content discovery capability within your CCMS. And the last two things would be enabling access so that readers, authors, stakeholders can get to what they need. Well, we're stakeholders in the house. We want to make sure that the doors, the windows, the entryways are all taken care of so that we can get in, move around. The same idea applies inside the CCMS. You want to make sure that people can get to the right places so that they can do the job that they need to do. ChatGPT closed it out by saying, do it right the first time. We wanted to ensure the quality construction, the finishing touches went in so that everything looked the way we wanted it to. All of this comes together at the end in the CCMS world. You want to follow the best practices and standards for creating accurate and effective documentation. So let's actually dive in. Let's take a look. Let's work inside the CCMS. And I'm going to show you some things that I like to do to make my life easier the first time around. Returning then to the document, but also comparing it to the log home. We talked to experts. We went out and we had people who knew what they were doing create the initial content. Let's do the same thing in Word. Let's have some people contribute. They can use Word, they can use styles, and they can give us a good document like this one to get started. So imagine a Word document. Somebody's already put it together using title, heading one, heading two, properly bulleting information, assigning all of the right styles, doing things the way that it should. Then you want to ingest that into guides, convert it to data. Maybe you need to reorganize it, and you might have templates and guides. There are different default templates that exist, and you can edit and create your own as well. I'm going to show you more about snippets so that you have an easy and efficient way to create content using either existing snippets or building your own and some of the complexity that goes into creating structured content that a snippet can help basically make go away. I'll also talk a little about reusing content and then switch over and basically poke at ideas. Just see things that I do again just to make my life easier. Along the way I'll also go in and try to show you a couple of different shortcuts, ways that you can streamline uh, content creation. So using keyboard shortcuts, creating lists, reorganizing the content, working with the interface, not just the toolbar that's at the top, but also the ones that are on the left and the right. And along the way, I will make sure that we've demonstrated. So creating, I'll have shown you that information. I'm going to show you how to lock files, how to go through and take version content and compare it, how to manage material, using assets, and showcasing additional things, behind the scenes techniques. So. I've written up these tips and tricks and I have content creation and the idea of starting inside Word and people are like, what? What do you mean you want to start inside Word? And why not? Make sure you're using the tools right and you can do some pretty impressive things. I'm actually going to go in and take this source Word file, bring it in and show it as a starting point. I won't work with it and do a lot of editing because I have other content that represents information better. But towards the end, I'll come back, we'll uh, take a look at it, make sure that we covered the things that we said we would cover. And again, the Word document that I have here covers in more detail some of the things that you're going to see live. I'll jump back and forth a couple of times. I'll go into the code view, work in the author view. Again, just different ways to work with the system. I'll also show you a bunch of neat little tricks in the interface. And then as I can, some of the newer features that are inside Maps so that you can just create, edit, reorganize, manage, publish. I'd love to go in and show native PDF functionality and smart templates. I've got them here as bullets. I'm going to run out of time. That's the bad news. The good news is that Sebastian and myself, so Sebastian from Mayo Clinic, 
uh, me, still from Precision Content. The two of us have actually done an entire session in which we showcase a little bit of Mayo Clinic's active implementation of the idea of native PDF capabilities and smart templates. Let's kick it off in a second by logging in, but first, yes, I'm speaking really quickly. This is a recorded session. You'll have access to it afterwards, so you can pause it. You can go back. You can timestamp and say, hey, there was a really cool thing. So track where we are in the session. Again, it's recorded. You can watch it. Take your own notes later on. My goal is to give you a lot of information. So I'm going to start off by taking the Word document that you saw a few moments ago and just drag and drop it into this conversion folder. Quick tip, it's getting dropped into a database type of an environment. Spaces are the enemy. So I start off by making sure I don't have spaces in my actual document name and then drag drop. That kicks off a customizable workflow. So right now it's actually going through converting the file and it's going to put it into an output folder. The entire output folder location, the way that it handles your Word documents, if you have custom things that I don't have in mind, all of it's configurable. Again, it's the type of thing we do as a business. A couple of seconds, the Word document's converted. Let's take a quick look at it. By the way, behind the scenes, it's all AEM assets for the file management. And I have a W2D, a word to data folder. And the cool thing about assets is that it's also Adobe. So it's being leveraged by Adobe Experience Manager, where AEM Guides is being used, and that's why this folder, Day in the Life, was created. This entire workflow took the ingested file, converted the material, stores it inside assets, lets me later on go in and do whatever I want with it, including in this case, open the folder. In this case, the converted Word document created a map as well as a collection of topics. The reason it did it is that in the styled Word document, I've already begun by using things like title, heading one, and heading two correctly. Clicking on that icon automatically open up the map inside the editor. I'll click on the pencil icon. For those of you that have worked with the software before and you're expecting to see the map editor, this is still inside the map editor, but there's a new outline view. Nice, clean, concise day in the life and then each of the main topics. You'll see tips and tricks can be expanded as well. Before I do that though, check this out. I'm about to show numbers. So again, take a look under day in the life at the topics. Here we go. This may not seem like a big deal to see the numbering down here, the one, two, three, four, but it makes it so much easier to just see the information in the hierarchy, especially if you start to get into more complicated nested content. Super easy to see 3.4 is content reuse rather than me telling you the words and you looking around. There's a bunch of ways to reorganize this so I can click and move it up. It's now represented by 3.3 and moving it back down is just as easy. Nice, quick, easy way to work with the map. I'm going to close it off, so I just click the X. By the way, the little asterisk next to Day in the Life just says that I've made changes, but I haven't saved it. The changes I made were the reorganization and so on. I'm just going to discard it without saving. Remember, there's icons that run down the left-hand side as well. Take advantage of these. This one's the repository, and I have some demo files. If you have a root folder called EN, in this case English, and another one called DE, there's actually some really cool machine translation capabilities built in so that as soon as you create content in the English, if you want to, you can go in and you can manage that and then publish it into the other language so that it gets you started with translation. It's a couple of button clicks and you've got your German version. It's not going to be perfect, but it's a quick starting point. I built some sample content for electric vehicles. Before I go too much further, I just want to mention the structure that's in here. You can see things like the vehicle guide, glove box owners, the American electrification, Asian electrification, buyer's guide, European electrification. These are the maps. In here, I also have things like dealer documentation. That would be a subfolder. I have the EV Adventures, which is my electric vehicle company's entire off-road and boating services. I have a common glossary, a set of images, a few more maps. I have a reuse folder as well, and then of course I have all of my topics. This is one way to organize the information so that I don't have too much clutter, too much showing up at once, and it makes it difficult to edit. Already talked to you about Word content, so I've shown you how to take the Word content, how to ingest it into guides, how to reorganize it. That was one of my core things I wanted to get through, but there's also the templates that are inside guides itself. When you go in and you create a data topic, where do you think it comes from? Behind the scenes, there's templates. There's a set of templates for topics and a set of templates for maps. This dropdown is driven by something called a folder profile. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Right now though, I'm just going to create a concept. I need a title for this and I'm probably not gonna have anything witty and clever. Literally, I'm going to create a sample concept just so that you can see what it looks like. And this is totally out of the box. And then I create the thing. Admittedly, a pretty bland start. This is my sample content. It has the short description, the paragraph. 
Uh, remember, I mentioned the tools that are along the left-hand side of the screen here. I'm going to click that double chevron and expand it so that I can see what the icons are called. Kind of a neat little idea. I can see all of the words. The last one, templates. Now, you may not see this in your instance. It depends on your permissions inside AEM Guides. I happen to be logged in as me. I have administrator rights inside the system, so I'm going to go into the templates to show a few cool things. I have templates for both maps and topics. In a moment, I'll open up concept, but I also want you to notice that I have the dealer docs and some patient consumer information. Again, there's this idea of smart templates. Instead of just going in and starting off with a default reference task concept and so on, you could actually build an entire shell of supporting documents. And then when you go in, for example, let's say in an automotive environment, you could take a set of dealer documentation and in bulk create a map that contains all of the different documentation that you need to get started so that instead of creating from scratch and dragging and dropping 38 different things from here, there, and the other place to build out your map, you can have a smart map and a set of smart topics that become part of an aptly named smart template. And again, we did that with some patient and consumer and other information with Mayo Clinic. So if you get the chance, watch the session that Sebastian and I do together on that. I'm also going to turn on the tags. So apologies to those that don't like using the tag view, but it's really helpful, especially when building templates. This is the same structure I saw a few moments ago when I went in and I actually created a brand new concept. Let's update this. I'm adding a little bit more to the structure. So I click after the P element. Control enter pops up a dialog and then I can start typing the name of the element that I want. So control enter is your shortcut to get a choice. It's similar to clicking the plus sign on the toolbar right near the top. As you type, this would narrow down and show you a set of elements that match your criteria. Here I'm using example, double click it. Decent start. I want to expand what goes into an example. It's a pretty boring element on its own. So again, I start to type. Two elements contain the word title, the title that I want, and the win title, so I can just double click the one that I want. Example and title, still a little bland. I'll just add a few more things. Again, control enter. Typing P kind of narrows it down to elements that contain the letter P. There's a, a lot of them, admittedly. The good news for me is that I actually want the P element, the paragraph, so again, double click. I'm being lazy, I'm just gonna save this. I could version it in order to compare them later on and track it and roll back and all the things that go. I'll show you some stuff with versions later. Not a lot, but I'll show you a few things. Take a look at the template for a second. I'm about to close it. In the background, you'll see the original sample concept. Remember, I've added the example title paragraph. Back to the repository, I'm going to now create something new based on that template. I'll start off the same way I click the ellipses in order to create something new. I'll work my way over to the data topic and I'll see the same pop up. Just in case you're looking for any kind of a trick, there's just the same choices under the drop down. I'll leave it here for just a second. Notice there's nothing about dealer and automotive and so on. There's just the usual concept, task reference type of stuff. Concept, same workflow that I created the last concept. But remember, I updated the template. In the background, you can still see the sample content from last time. Uh, again, still no witty, clever name here. So I'll just create another sample content. Even in a planned and recorded session, I can't come up with anything better than sample content two. My expectation is that when I click create, I will have a new sample content document named sample content two, but the structure is going to be different than what's in the background. Watch for it. There it is, ta-da, ooh, magic. No, it's just that I've updated the template. All I did though was I took an existing template, modified the structure of it, saved it, and now it's automatically available. That's okay. I also wanna go in and show you how to create a new template and then enable it. By the way, the dealer docs that I have are just a generic idea around the electric vehicle, but you could have anything in here. Again, I also have patient consumer information. These dealer docs, the four that you see, in order to create them, I took dealer docs, clicked the ellipses, chose new, created a topic concept task reference type of information, populated it, and when I was done, I was left with this list. The only thing that I haven't done yet is enabled it. That's why in the previous drop downs, I said you saw nothing about any dealer agreements, authorized models, nothing. Topic concept task reference and so on, none of these dealer docs yet. Now, we have to switch out of the role of an author for a moment and see what an admin might do. White transition slide. I'm now in the tools and I'm going to take guides and adjust the folder profiles. This is where you get to set up things like templates. 
Cool tip, by the way, you can create additional folder profiles. So I often create different folder profiles for clients. Might go in and set them up so that specific groups inside an organization have permission to work in different areas in different ways. I'll show you what that means in a moment. There are a bunch of videos in the Adobe Experience League collection that my team helped create in order to market and promote the way that the software works. That includes videos that show you more about conditional attributes, authoring template, output preset, and the XML editor configuration. There's literally several hours worth of material out there that you can look at that goes into more details. Right now, authoring template is all I'm going to work with. The topic templates are limited. There's nothing in there about the automotive. These are the ones that we saw a few minutes ago when I created new content. The nice thing is that, again, I'm the admin. I'm going to go in and add templates that my users who work in the global profile, which is basically everybody, are going to be able to work with. Before anyone panics, I'm going to scroll down. And after task, I have the authorized model, service information, territory, etc. So this is the automotive info. I'm just going to add one template for service information just for ease of speed. Bottom of the list, after troubleshooting, service information. Top corner, save. And in the same tone, middle of screen, success. All right, I'm done playing administrator. Let's go see what this means for the day-to-day -day author. Another magical white transition screen. All right, over in the author world, somebody comes along, goes to the topics, clicks the ellipses. Same idea of creating a new data topic, but remember, we added a template. I'm expecting the topic dropdown to have more choices. Ooh, ah, the drama. There's service information. Now, if I did a concept, I'd still get the concept with the extra example, etc. But in this case, I'm actually going to go in and choose the brand new template. Sticking with the letter S, I'm going to create a new topic. My two previous samples are going to get another sample for service information. At least it'll make it easy to find all the files that start with the word sample so that I can clean up my repository later. By the way, that template contains a lot more information in it than my initial task concept reference. I'm dealing with a dealership. I want to make sure that the service information is quite comprehensive in order to get started. Maybe I'm putting together legal documents in order to get a new automotive service center up and running. It better have the right content. Here, all I did was I created one document based on the one template, so it's pretty decent. But had I gone in and used a smart template set, I could have actually created a map. And again, that map could have contained 5, 10, 40, different unique components, and it would have pulled all of them together and populated them so that you can start off by building an entire collection instead of one file at a time. You can even point to reusable things, like for example, a legal document, so that when you use the smart template and you build a brand new map, all of the legal information always points to a non-editable, consistent legal document that's included, as well as all of the shell material, like what you see here, that then could be modified in regards to each individual dealership, or each medical condition, or each software procedure, or each API document that you create. So imagine the possibilities of smart templates. All right, enough on templates. Let's transition and go look at the next thing. Again, that double chevron over on the left-hand side is your friend. Take advantage of your screen real estate and get to know what the icons mean. Snippets, super cool idea. Think of a snippet as being a predefined structure. It's not going to have the exact same content time after time, but it's going to have the same structure so that instead of creating a complex layout, you could just click and drag from the snippet right into your document. I'll show you what I mean. Instead of creating a section and then creating a title, I can grab a section with title from my snippets and drag it over. Now these are pre-existing snippets. I'll show you how to create them in a second. Technically, it's a section with a title and a P element. I actually use these samples for a lot of things, so I'll just select and delete that. Snippets are also a little picky. For example, if you have a snippet component for things like a step, you can't throw it into a concept. So I'm going to go into the repository and find another document so that I can demo different snippets. I've got a task that explains how to charge an electric vehicle. Amongst other things, this includes steps that then allow for one or more step. This snippet is going to be for a step with info or results. It's basically a more involved step rather than just getting step and command. Then drag and drop to a valid location. When I created these snippets, I actually wrote in a couple of words like these, double click for this, that, or the other, so that somebody gets a little bit of guidance and they just double click and type in what they want. Uh, of course, if they don't need as many list items, they could always select the list item and delete it. 
you can still add other things. It's just a starting point for a structural component so that you don't have to create all of it from scratch every single time. So that's a thing. I double click and I type. And I can do that over and over. So that's snippets. That's using an existing snippet. I take the snippet, I drag and drop. I don't need it anymore, so I'm going to delete, select it, press delete. I'm going to build out the result as well. So this is a little more behind the scenes work in order to set something up to build a snippet. Select the location, control enter, etc. Knowing your data helps, typing, putting in the post rec as soon as I start to type it, narrows it down. And double click. I'll add a bit more to it. So inserting the elements, right? That click, control, enter, etc. Nice, easy, quick ways to create content. That's the basics of building a snippet. I'm going to give it some content as well. By the way, here's a little embedded tip. If you need to create a list, just create a set of paragraphs first. Then I click and drag to select both of them. Here's why. Once I've selected both of them, I move up and on the top toolbar, click the bullet. They become part of a list item and part of an unordered list. And then I can nest that by dragging and dropping it into the P element to build that logical connection between the parent and the child. As soon as the parent UL is selected, both child LI elements are also selected and drag and drop. The hierarchy is nice. As soon as I click on the P element, I automatically get the nested UL and the nested LI elements. In the same way, when I select the post rec, I get all of the child elements of the post rec. I'll pause for a second, take a look. Cut, and copy, insert, after, insert, before. If you want to rename an element, I've done that in the past, where I take an OL and I want to rename it into a UL, or vice versa. Unwrap an element. For example, I have something that's wrapped in, let's say, code phrase, and I realize I don't actually need it as a code phrase, it was an error. I could unwrap it so that I remove the structure, but I keep the words. In this case, though, I'm going to create a snippet. The dialog's pretty easy to navigate. You put in some of your info at the top and the bottom, you see the sample snippet. If you needed to, you could actually go in and do some further edits. Obviously, give it a title that's going to make sense when somebody sees it in the snippet panel on the left. Do the same for the description. And a typo. I'll go ahead and create it anyway. You could always go in and edit a snippet, the title, the description, after the fact if you needed to most likely because you may want to update the content of the snippet, but hey, hypothetically, you could have a typo in the description. Having created this, I'll obviously select it and delete it. All that work actually did pay off though. I have my new snippet, so I drag and drop it. Because this is now an existing snippet, I drag, drop. So create your own snippets, use them for more complex items as well, like a complex step, table with merged materials, if you have a bunch of pre-written text that you want to use or a complex example structure, great, go for it. Take advantage of them. As with before, double click, edit. And I double click on the first nested bullet. This snippet's also a great way to give somebody who doesn't really get the idea of structured authoring a way to start with structured authoring. You just give them the shell, a place to write, and the opportunity to do things the right way as opposed to whatever way they want. Now it's easy for even a non-technical person to contribute. By the way, the event you're at is called Ditta World, so I am showing you the Ditta tags on inside here. If you had turned those off, somebody would look at this, not even see the markup, and just start working. All right, templates and snippets. So I showed you working with templates inside guides, some of the defaults that exist, editing a template, creating new ones, enabling them. I showed you snippets how to use an existing snippet and how to create your own. And the idea of building these combinations are really, really useful. It gives you a way that you can create content broadly for the non-technical user to get in and get started with structured content. Very cool thing. All right, next up, reusing content. I want to talk about reusing entire topics, going in and taking an entire collection of information putting it into one or more maps, and then what happens when you change it. I have content inside the map for European electrification, and it's a child of invest in the future. Within this document is the reused pricing chart. Look at the top right corner of the table. So from left to right, I have the electric car, electric motors, Inc., the E-sedan, etc., the pricing, 37000 to 100000 
this pricing chart document is used for my European document. It's also used in other maps. I also have my Asian electrification document. Same structure. Remember, these could have been based on a smart template so that every time I build a new document set for different parts of the world, I automatically consolidate information into one place. Grab it, publish it, make sure that it's consistent across the board. Let's see what's under it. Yep, pricing chart. For argument's sakes, production got less expensive. We were able to find more ways to automate workflows. We we're able to go in and reduce the price that we charge consumers so that we remain competitive against any other organization that's out there making electric vehicles. So I've been told to lower the price. And just like that, 11,000 off of the top end price. I'm going to create a brand new version. So I'm not just saving over top of it, but I'm creating a snapshot in time, a point that I can go back to and say, give me the before, give me the after, and hopefully also give me the logic or the reason that this change was made. Comments and labels make it easier later on to find things and know why a change was made. By the way, if you look to the right top of the shaded area, you'll see that the current version reads 1.1 with an asterisk. Basically, it's version 1.1, but it has changed. I've saved this file a couple of times since the last time that it was worked with. So it has the asterisk next to the version number. The version number is also at the top of the dialog that I'm working with. So bear in mind, I currently have a 1.1. I've made modifications, lowered the price, etc. I'm going to save. I open this up from inside the Asian map. I'm now going to save, close, version, etc. and shut down the files that I have open. I've still got at least one other map where this is used. Let's pop open American electrification and see what we find. Same invest in the future. And it's actually the same pricing chart. You'll see that the price has updated here. I didn't have to go in and open up another version of the file. I didn't have to go out and find it somewhere else and say, oh, I've done a copy and paste. I just take one source and I update and modify it. So I'm reusing an entire topic. And when I make a change, it impacts everything. Now it's important to know if you make a change that there's going to be potentially more than one thing that's impacted. So let's go explore that idea as well. So far I've gone in, I've reused an entire topic. For example, all of the pricing information across multiple deliverables. I'm opening up legal and on the right hand side, I'm now going to go in and take a look at some document level properties. What you currently see is topic information for what I have open, but I also have references used in really important. I know exactly where this document is used. If I make a change to it, I should be really careful because it's going to impact multiple deliverables. But I also have some of the links out of this. I have that battery puncture information that I'm going to go and make a modification to. So take a look at the attention. The note that's in blue that says battery puncture is a serious hazard. This is approved reusable information. So I'm going to update the phrasing here and let's pretend we go through the whole review and legal has told us we have to make a change, etc. Nice quick edit. I'm going to be really careful when I do anything here. I'm going to version the material because this is reused. I want to be really careful about what's impacted and why I make a change. I'll add my notes. And remember, regulatory requirements might actually require that I track all of this formally so that if ever there's a problem or a miscommunication down the road and something happens, we can go back and know exactly what changed and when, who made the modification and so on. The rest of this is common. It's the same workflow. When I'm done, I save. Let's go see what that means. Another tip within a tip, I've got a bunch of files open here, so I'm going to right click on one of the tabs up in the topic list. A lot of choices. Uh, you may want to play with the idea of the locate in or the split if you have a couple of them open, kind of a neat one. I'm just going to go in and tell it to close and close all the topics. I'll pop open the buyer's guide and see what the impact was of the change that I just made to the battery info. Again, the blue information inside here has the updated note exactly the way that I've changed it because that is a conref. So I have reused entire topics. I've also gone in and reused specific content references. And when I make a modification to it, it updates everywhere. So there's some easy wins, notes, tips, and so on. Uh, you can have really complex combinations, but the great thing is this is all tracked. You know exactly what was changed, where it was changed, what the impact of it is. All right, final stretch. This is a different way to do reuse. I have 
three paragraphs in the middle. I have one on gas, I have one on pure electric, and one on hybrid. But the rest of the information around it remains the same. So I need a way that I can selectively show and hide conditional content. Think of things like product or platform or audience specific information. Currently I've got a couple things bottom up. I've got that yellowy orange on the hybrid warranty. That's just a generic default. I've got the green one on the battery. That's actually the electric vehicle and you can see that I've customized the conditions already. I also have a condition that exists for gasoline that I want to apply to the paragraph above the green. I then have a few choices. One of them is to click the ellipses and apply. In a second you'll see it turn that same gray background from gasoline. And what you just saw was the application of a condition. So gasoline was applied, electric vehicle, not only is it applied, but it's already got a custom platform. And what if you have other types of product platform audience, in this case platform, you've already got things assigned to it, but you wanna stylize it, super easy. You click inside, in this case, the hybrid info. This is how you stylize a new format for a condition. You literally click in it and then a plus sign. Then you fill in the dialog. I'm actually guided by the attribute information on the right hand side of my screen. So I know that this is platform, I know that it's hybrid. Conditions are really easy to work with. The entire interface is actually easy to work with. I'm also going to change the default color. And it's just a visual pop up. I could change other things, but for now the blue and apply. Watch for two things under the conditions platform. There's the electric vehicle and the gasoline. and watch the orange gold yellow color that you see on that last of the conditional paragraphs. That's pretty nice. Let me also show the preview. Notice that highlight conditional text is selected and that's why you're seeing the colors. But you can also see the three conditions and of course as I click the check marks watch what happens to the main content. I get rid of the option for gasoline and I'm left seeing only the electric and the hybrid. On its own, this is kind of nice for the author. You get to see the different combinations, but you can actually go in at publish time and tell it to include or to exclude specific combinations of product platform audience. So I could publish and say only the hybrid version or only the electric vehicle information and all of the other content is hidden. So I have a couple of reuse scenarios here. Really cool stuff. Back in the author world, there's one more thing I want to show you. I've already gone through and worked with a combination of templates and snippets and reuse. Oh my. I want to go in and just show you something with code view. This is a convenient place to show it. I don't often dive into the code, but it's, it's really useful sometimes for very specific things. Remember, my platforms right now have electric vehicle, gasoline and hybrid. You can see those inside the conditions, but let's go look at the code for a moment. Line eight shows that the platform is gas. Behind the scenes, it is gas, and you'll see on nine electric and so on, but gas is the technical value. Gasoline is the human value that a person sees. As mentioned, electric for the electric vehicle. This means that you could have really technical, small pieces of information behind the scenes, but for your day-to-day -day user that may be working or for yourself where you don't want to go through and track what each of the individual short little codes might mean, you can have a much more human friendly version and you can color code the material. Don't be scared to take a look at the code version. Don't necessarily change it, but don't be scared to take a look at the code version. Sometimes it's useful. And if you do go in and make a modification in the code view, if you mess up the structure, it actually will flag it and not allow you to switch back and you have your undo option. So don't worry too much if you're testing, experimenting a little bit inside this environment. All right, back to the author view. Friendlier, easier. Time is tight. Let's do a couple of additional quick things in the repository. In the repository under the topics, the third entry is charging considerations. You'll see there's a little icon next to that. Another user happens to be Alex. Another user has that file checked out right now. I can take any file, click on the ellipses, and do a multitude of things, including check out the file. Really important one, especially if you're working in a large group of people. The file's now checked out by me. I'm the only one who can modify it, nice to know. If an administrator needs to come along, that can actually be changed. But for the time being, the file's checked out by me, no one else will make a modification. Just closing up things, saving files quickly, etc. Right, pricing. Okay, let's go in and take a quick look at this file as well. Remember I changed the price on that? I dropped it from like 100,000 down to 89,000. 
if you show markup and then you compare versions, so make sure you use that versioning, the version 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, take advantage of things like the comment or the version labels, but if you use that, check this out. I can do a compare. Red and green, strike through an insertion. There's so much that I can do as an author in order to track what's happening inside my files. So a lot of really, really powerful capability built into the system. Use it. We're getting close to wrap up. So if there's any questions, anything you want to put into the chat for those who are in the live environment, obviously, if you're watching the video, I can't do much to help you out. Uh, you can reach out to me. I'll put my contact information at the end. But if there's any questions, throw them in the chat. All right, so uh, let's see. We've talked about templates. We've talked about snippets. We've gone in and worked with reuse. I've shown you the author view. We've streamlined a bunch of different things that you can be doing. Keyboard shortcuts, lists, bullets, numbers. Lots of this stuff would go into the summary. Uh, I've demonstrated how to create content, locking files, versioning, comparing. So I want to show you assets. This is the Word document that we ingested earlier, and I'm going to select it. My workflow put it into the Word to Data environment, so I'm going to actually take it and move it elsewhere. I can change around properties along the way by clicking and typing. For example, a recap for the day. Again, avoid names with spaces. You don't actually have to remember that. As soon as you try to type a space, it just prevents it. I'm moving it out of the Word to Data into Demo, and then into the English source folder. And a few moments pass, there it is recapping the day. So let's pop it open and take a look what's in here. In the map, I can hover and click that first icon. This thing started off as a Word document earlier today. The map preview is also really helpful. Remember, I started off with this document. That table was a picture. If I was to delete that from the file, I could actually grab a table out of a Word document or an Excel file, copy and paste it some really cool automated ways to bring content in into the final minutes and I'm still going through and talking through tips and tricks. So under an hour, uh, yes, if you're using Adobe Experience Manager Guide, there's a lot of stuff that you can do. And hopefully I've been able to give you a bunch of shortcuts in order to, at the end of the day, work less and do more. It's actually a lot of info to try to pack into the time we had. So tips and tricks, content creation, templates, inside guides, check mark. Content reuse, not just the copy and paste. We went in, we did reuse of the same topic across multiple maps. We worked with Conref's conditional content, code view and author view. I also showed you a couple of additional shortcuts, things that you can do to speed up your work. Just as I worked my way through, I tried to cover a little bit of everything. And again, time is always the enemy. The Word document that we loaded became a map. I dropped it into the English folder in the Manage tab, amongst other things. I could actually go in and select the language for German and kick off translation. I'd be remiss not to show you published. Check this out. That Word document, drag, drop, I reorganized it, moved it into another different location, gave it a name. Now I'm going to publish it. These are out of the box, so AEM site. Let's go do it. I'm going to go and view the output just before we wrap up. All of the information that you see here, this was just a Word document, drag and drop. Now I've gone and published it. Because I had title, day in the life, because I had my heading ones for things like the intro or the additional shortcuts, because I had a title level one and two for the tips and tricks and the information that comes underneath it, this is what I'm able to do. I can come along and I can take source content that was unstructured Word, bring it into AEM Guides. Within AEM Guides, I can do a bunch of things as a day-to-day -day user of the system. And I showed you a couple of tips that apply in the case of a system admin as well. But broadly speaking, this, this is the way that you should be working with content. Let people create and contribute, then take that information, review it, manage it, and once you're ready, publish. That workflow is completely automated through the guides environment. So if you're looking for more information on AEM guides, feel free to reach out to me. I'll wrap it up where I started, back at the log home. So we've got this, it's finished. There's always going to be other things that you want to do. You set up an environment where things are supportive, things are developed, and then you start to work and you realize there's other things that need to be done and changed. So in our case, on the outside of the house, we wanted to put in some additional steps. We want to work with a dock. We want to build a boathouse, so we need a platform for it. There's other things that are being done. 
In the same way with content, with the CCMS, you're going to install and configure and set it up and start working with it. And you're going to realize here's additional things that we want to do. I've shown you some of those, some of the template work, some of the snippet work, some of the content reuse with conditional content and so on. Once you've got that done and you think everything's resolved, you move on to the next adventure. In this case, if you recall, if you were here a year ago, I mentioned that my wife and I went and we did a tour with Andy the Highlander and explored some of the scenes and sites in and around Scotland. Uh, specifically going to Lallybroch. This is us on the steps of that location from the Outlander series. And you get together and you celebrate the wins. That's exactly what you want to do with your AEM guides implementation. You want to go in, you want to build it up, but then you want to take that and start figuring out what's the next adventure. What's the next thing that you can do with the system? That might be something like native PDF. It might be something like working with smart templates. And you want to share these experiences. Here, we're traveling. We've brought along friends and family in order to go to Iceland and explore. At this point in time, consider what you're doing, again, inside the world of your own CCMS adventure. You go through, you start to learn, you attend sessions like this, take the information that you've discovered, that you've learned, and apply it back at the office. Share it. Talk to other people. Give them the experience of being able to successfully do things. Help develop the internal skill set so that you can continue to do the fun things, the interesting things. QR code again, or just do a Google search for Bernard Ashwand and LinkedIn, you're going to find me. But top left, QR code, that'll get to my LinkedIn. Bottom QR code, that'll get you to our Precision Content page where you can register and we'll do a demo, work with you with your own content, give you a chance to actually see it and experience what happens in the real world when your content gets into the AEM Guides type of an environment. Lastly, a big thanks to Adobe, Stefan, the entire sales team, the marketing team, the development team, the customers that we're working with. I mentioned things like taking a look at the Mayo Clinic presentation that Sebastian and I did so that you can see smart templates and the native PDF capabilities. These types of functions are built into the product because my team has the opportunity to talk to our customers and to talk directly to the Adobe team and work together in order to build and improve the product into what you see here today. So a broad thank you to everybody, and of course, to every single person who's attending this session or watching the video after the fact. Appreciate your time. Look forward to speaking with you in person. Take care. Hello, and welcome to the last presentation of today. I want to talk about intelligent content for the manufacturing industry. My name is Ulrike Parson, and I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Parson, which is located in Northern Germany in Hamburg. We are information architects and help people to break up their documents into smart content. We also do consulting and content strategy and uh, support customers in introducing component content management systems and content delivery portals. And we also do some technical writing, mainly for software products. We have been an Adobe partner for a very long time and a specialized in DIDA and uh, Adobe Experience Manager Guide. OK, let's talk about the manufacturing industry and the challenges it faces today. The first challenge is uh, environment protection or climate protection. Manufacturers need to increase the um, share of energy supply that comes from renewable sources in order to reach carbon neutrality along their supply chain. They are also um, obliged to report on their corporate carbon footprint. There's new legislation on the way or already in place um, in Europe that uh, suppliers and manufacturers need to report about the carbon footprint that they generate. And this uh, holds true for their complete supply chain. Another big challenge is the cost of production um, while facing the same competitive situation in the market. Inflation has increased over the last few months and there's a lot of pressure on the margin for manufacturers. They need to control their production costs while at the same time making sure that their supply chain, fun supply chain functions in uh, all situations. And especially the pandemic, pandemic has increased the um, demands on the supply chain. 
more and more manufacturers are uh, changing um, the uh, their sub suppliers in order to make the supply chain more resilient. Customers of manufacturer demand personalized products so that manufacturers need to put out more product variants in order to fulfill the configuration demands of their customers. At the same time, they need to come to the market to put those products into the market in a shorter time, meaning they need to decrease the time to market for their products. Customers do no longer want to buy products on trade for affairs or want to be called by sales representatives. Rather, they want to select products and learn about product, pro products and also buy products in a digital way in e-shopping solutions and on websites and in, in applications. So digital marketing becomes more and more important also for the manufacturing industry. Another big challenge is the change in the in the skilled uh, the, the shortage of skilled labor and the change in, in the working force. We do see the effects of the changing population pyramid pyramid, especially in Northern America and also in Europe. There's there's more and more older people and, and fewer younger people enter the working market. So the war for talents has already begun. And uh, when you have to fill a vacancy in your company, there's um, a time of six to eight months now in Germany until you find a suitable person that wants to take the job and that you want to have in the job. Also new employees, younger employees have other expectations when it comes to their professional life. They want to have a meaningful job. They want to collab collaborate. They want to work in teams. Uh, and they want to, to work with modern tools and in a modern environment. The digitalization itself is a challenge to the manufacturing industry because their products need to become more digital. They need to become smart and uh, interconnectable so that they can be integrated into smart factories and used for smart uh, productions. Because um, software layers and software supplements to machinery is the basis for data-driven business models like uh, paper use or uh, paper production time, things like that. And it's also the basis for um, remote uh, service and uh, for predictive maintenance. All these requirements are not made easier by existing data silos with the manufacturing companies and technical debts like um, companies have different ERP systems uh, in different um, branches in within their company or um, they have other silos like uh, that engineering um, is separated from, from the product master data or that the uh, product master data are not linked to the website, for example. So all these challenges lead to uh, specific key trends in the manufacturing industry. And I want to show you some of these and concentrate on uh, key trends that also involve intelligent content so that you can learn how intelligent content may support these trends. So let us first talk about what intelligent content is, how we define it. It's actually the digital transformation of documents into smaller units of information that um, can be viewed in different media, media, that can be transported to other systems, that can be used in modern applications like augmented reality and virtual reality, and that can be used by digital assistants like chatbots. That means intelligent content has specific properties, technical properties. It needs to be structured, for example, based on XML, and it needs to be format free so that it can be rendered in different media and in different, uh, on different devices. Intelligent content is always modular and can be reused uh, in different information products, but also across systems. Intelligent content is semantic, meaning it's uh, enriched with metadata that describe um, where it can be used, to which product variant it belongs, to which component it belongs, which target audience uh, is able to understand that, that pros, um, uh, information or um, yeah, entitled to use that information. Based on these properties, 
intelligent content uh, can be searched individually and can be retrieved as an individual mo mod module and can be processed in applications. If you leave all the techniques aside, uh, intelligent content of course needs to be useful because we do no longer know where our content will pop up. We need to write content that is self-contained and that answers one question and that describes one fact so that you don't need surrounding information to actually understand it. Because it is intelligent content, we no longer talk about publishing content, we talk about delivering content in an electronic digital way. That also means that intelligent content can come from different sources. It, it, sources. it can be marketing content, it can be technical documentation content, or it can also be product information like technical data. And on the receiving end, you need a software that is able to process that content. So intelligent content is not intelligent per se, but becomes intelligent uh, with applications. Okay, let's look at some trends that we see in the manufacturing industry. The first big trend is uh, our digital twins. Forbes defines digital twins as a digital copy of an actual, actual physical asset. And this, uh, such an asset can be a product, like machine or a component. It can be a process or a complete ecosystem. And this digital copy contains a list of all the components that is uh, contained in this asset, the services, um, and of course, also the information that describes uh, those products or components. A digital twin can be used for different purposes. You can use this virtual representation for simulations, for instance, for so that manufacturers can try how different product configuration behaves. It can be used to be delivered with the product and uh, collect live data from the operation of the product. Any changes that are made in the actual physical asset also need to be uh, reflected in the digital twin. So digital twins are very useful and they are the basis um, for digital, digitalized processes, for simulations and also for new business models like predictive maintenance because digital twins enable to um, enable manufacturers and also the companies that operate the machinery to collect data on how the machine behaves, um, how it reacts to different environmental conditions, how it reacts to um, different uh, temperatures, operating conditions, and also how often a specific error or warning pops up. So the uh, digital twin is not just um, used for developing the products, also it also lives with the product during operation and contains a digital lifecycle record of the machine. And the live data that is provided by sensors and, and other components enables business cases like predictive maintenance. I want to show you one example of a company that uses a digital representation of the products, and this is from Kona, which is a Finnish manufacturer of elevators. And these elevators are not only used for um, transporting people from uh, one story to the next, but it's also used for machinery and uh, large devices. So they are come in all different sizes and shapes, and of course it's difficult to find all this equipment in one place, especially in the place where the technical writers are looking or where the subject matter experts that do the quality assurance are located. So what Kona did is that they put um, their machinery, that they digitalized uh, the machinery that they created digital twin and put those in a virtual in, uh, environment, in a virtual reality environment, where um, the technical writers that write the maintenance documentation can uh, try out how um, how the maintenance is done. They have the tools there, they have the technical components there. What they also have there is the content that is uh, database and based and comes from their CCMS, and which can be used within the virtual re uh, reality environment to actually try out the maintenance procedures. And the experts, the uh, technicians, use uh, the uh, instructions to actually check the maintenance uh, documentation. 
They can also leave comments with the documentation that um, the technical writers can use to change the content and update the content. So this is both a um, test environment uh, and a communication basis. And on this slide, you can see um, how smart their content is because it's adapted to the environment. On the left, you see the content, how it is dis displayed in the virtual reality. It's shorter, it's just one step, and you can click previous and next. And on the right, you see the rendering for a manual, and there you see that uh, the step is numbered and the two steps are displayed on one page. So the content is processed in different way depending on the context. Intelligent content is perfect for digital twins. Content that describes products and, and services needs to be part of digital twins. And because of the properties of uh, intelligent content, it can be assembled in a digital twin of a product, perfectly matching the product configuration that is contained in the digital twin. Because our content modules are semantic, they have metadata that describe to which product variant and component they belong, so that they can pick, be picked out of the information tool and to, uh, pool and assembled into the digital twin. Any application that is working with the digital twin can use uh, the, the format free uh, content to display it. Um, for, for example, uh, on a dashboard or in um, data glasses or also on um, portable devices for service technicians that go through a plant, for example. Individual content modules may be replaced during the lifecycle, for example, if a firmware is updated or if a part is exchanged. And you can connect um, the, the, the digital twin with instructions. For example, if due to a sensor alarm, a specific maintenance work needs to be done, you can um, find the relevant content for this maintenance task and display it to the operators. There are different industry initiatives that want to standardize digital twins. ISO is working on a digital twin framework for manufacturing that shall help um, manufacturers to choose the, the building blocks for the digital twin implementations. And the IDTA, which is an uh, industrial consortium, is working on the so-called asset administration shell, which is the technical format for digital twins. And this shell, uh, shell, uh, this shell will help manufacturers to generate the digital twins that are actually interoperable, so that within a smart factory or within a plant, uh, different digital twins can be assembled and merged. Okay, let's have a look at the second trend, which is removing silos within the companies. Currently, there are a lot of data silos with, within companies. You have the ERP system, you have the product information management system, you have the um, system that controls production, and then you have, of course, the website, a technical communication, all that are different data sets. Although there is information that should actually be the same and that should come from the same source, for example, technical data. So what a lot of manufacturing companies are working on is establishing a so-called digital threat, uh, meaning a, a chain of um, data that goes from, from the design and the development of the products to through uh, manufacturing and which where the data come from a single source of truth and are transported uh, through the system so that information can be reused and if the source of truth changes then the information in the other systems changes as well that also means that companies need to harmonize the product data. Um, right now, as I said, you have product information, for instance, in a product configurator, in an ERP system, and the product information management systems, and they are not always consistent. So what we see in our project that a lot of uh, companies are working on uh, harmonization, on a data cleansing of their product data. Actually, bridging those silos can be done in different ways. You can connect the silos or use integration software or API layer software to connect the silos. Uh, typical examples of connections are between a product information management system and an ERP system like SAP. 
Another typical example is that you connect the information that is published on a website to the product information management system like Censure so that the product information is injected directly into the website. And also see, we see integrations between uh, Salesforce and um, the documentation platform, for example. This integration can also be done using knowledge graphs um, and um, because they are able to link information that comes from different sources. Another way of integrating silos is using platform solutions, which cover several business cases and several business needs in one platform. Adobe Experience Manager is such a platform where you can solve your business cases for marketing, for e-commerce, but also for a technical documentation. I want to show you an example of how to integrate information from different silos. And this is from Zig, which is a producer of equipment for assembly lines. And I picked an example from their safety light curtains. And this is their product finder. And you can find and filter products by these nice facets, and, uh, which probably come from a product information management system. And then uh, once you have found the right product family, you can also see the technical data that are valid for this product. And this data probably comes from the engineering system at one point in time. And the next click brings you to the technical documentation. So this user journey is very seamless and the users can get all the information that they need for actually purchase, purchasing the product and configure the product to their needs in one place. The second talked about knowledge graphs is from Endless and Hauser, who, uh, which produces um, sensor and flow meters uh, equipment also for the manufacturing industry. And they use the knowledge graph to combine their product model with the technical documentation. So all the, right, the red dots are product variants and product properties. And these are connected to the technical documentation, which are the blue dots here on the blue notes on the left side. So whenever they assemble a product according to a purchase order, for instance, um, they can assemble the documentation that fits this product automatically. This is completely driven by the product model. So intelligent content is a, is a perfect foundation for digital, digitalized processes because the modular content can be transferred along the digital thread through the systems. The metadata that intelligent content carries can be used to attach content to product variants, to components, and uh, this supports integration into other systems. It also supports content assembly based on, on a purchase order, on an order code, or based, based on a bill of material for a, um, the delivery to a specific customer. If you want to use um, intelligent content for digitalized processes, there are some useful standards. As a content format, DITA is a, is a good choice because it's machine readable format neutral and can be processed by application and applications and rendered to different formats and on different devices. For the metadata, you can use IRDS, which stands for Intelligent Information Request and Delivery Standard. Uh, RDF, uh, uh, IRDS uses RDF for its metadata vocabulary, which is also a machine readable metadata format. If you work with knowledge graphs and want to use ontologies, and especially industrial ontologies, you can go to the IOF, which is the Industrial Ontology Foundry, and which offers uh, open reference ontologies for manufacturing and engineering. There's a standard for a product classification that you can use to consolidate your product data, which is called E-Class. And ISO is also working on a framework for modeling industrial data. This is uh, still work in progress. As you see, it's uh, still with a, a technical committee and not a published standard yet, as far as I know. 
Okay, we talked about shortage of skilled people um, and shortages in, a, in the workforce. So the third trend um, addresses this challenge. We have to support people in their work because we have fewer and fewer of them and because when the older generation leaves the work market, we need to um, collect their knowledge and transfer the knowledge to the younger people. So that is, that is why a lot of applications are coming up that uh, support labor intensive processes and that support um, the knowledge transfer refer to, to people. Of course, it's AR and VR for training, but also for operation. Um, and um, this is, uh, is done to actually uh, skill up people uh, within the uh, companies. The, the other means, the self help for customer is done in order to support um, your customers or the, the customers on the, of the manufacturers, which will reduce uh, support efforts with the manufacturers. Remote service is another uh, trend that uh, also came up due to the pandemic. Um, we don't have enough people to send them to all the production sites, so manufacturers need to find solutions uh, to enable remote service. Um, information that service technicians use uh, in order to for for their service tasks and in order to need uh, less time for a specific service time uh, a task needs to be product specific so it, it is uh, crucial that we no longer deliver um, service instructions which cover several product variants but very specific information um, support for labor intensive processes can also be done by chatbots, by digital assistants, and of course, within the production environment, uh, robots and cobots are used. Let's have a look at some examples. Self help for customers, uh, which will reduce your support efforts, can also be realized in Adobe Experience Manager. This example is from a technical documentation that is a documentation of a robot and which is part of the demo content that Adobe provides and that we generated. So this is data content and here you see the content about the stepper motor and how to connect it to the other components of the robot. So this is normal data content that you write in AEM guides. And then you can use the asset metadata that is available in AEM to actually put, to make the content semantic, to put the metadata about the component, in this case the motor, and about the product lifecycle phase, in this case assembly, and attach it to the topic, to this piece of intelligent information. And you can use this metadata later on in a delivery, for example, in AEM sites to generate search facets. And here you can find the search facet again, the stepper motor, and we also selected the task. And this um, leads to a very shortened hit list, um, search result list, uh, where the third hit is already our topic about connecting the stepper motor. So the metadata enables people to quickly find the required information. So you have the complete chain from authoring through cement, uh, semantic um, information put to the module to um, targeted delivery in AEM sites. Another example for intelligent content uh, for supporting people is training. Siemens, for example, uses content uh, training content and puts them in smart glasses which are attached to a helmet and they use it in order to train people in energy plants for instance remotely so people can go on site put on the helmet and the glasses and make an on-site training which is supported by augmented reality and for consumers we have examples from the automotive industry this is an hmi from a porsche uh, where they use augmented reality in the head-up display to, to show uh, the route and some, some options. And this is the uh, operator's manual from a BMW. Um, the content, as far as I know, comes from Dida. And in the, in the car itself, you have exactly the content that fits the car configuration. And the user can uh, search the content, can uh, view individual topics, can also view uh, videos and, and instructions online in the HMI of the car. So intelligent content supports people in their work because it can be 
publish to different channels and because it carries metadata um, so that it can be connected to product components and product variants and supports um, faceted search and personalization of content. So intelligent content is very useful also in the um, manufacturing industry. However, the industry is a traditional one. So if you want to um, embark on that journey and get from documents to intelligent content, we are here to help you. And um, we do have some best practices that we, in, that we apply when we accompany uh, customers on, on the journey to intelligent content. And the first thing is that you need to define your strategic, strategic goals and requirements for intelligent content. Where does your digitalization strategy lead to? What do you want to achieve for both internally and for example, in order to support your service or your sales? And what do you want to achieve externally for your customers? What are your customers asking for it? Are you, for instance, required to deliver a digital twin? Or do you want to integrate the documentation of your component into a larger set of documents? So this needs to be defined so that you can know in which, in which parts you want to invest in intelligent content. A good choice is always to start where it hurts most or where you gain most. So a lot of our customers start with service. Um, they support service uh, technicians by giving them product specific information, by giving them content that is displayed on handhelds, on uh, mobile phones or in, in, in data glasses. Um, so that the service technicians are able to do their task in a shorter period of time. And the second good point to start is sales. Um, pushing sales or supporting sales with uh, content is a good choice because good content increases the visibility of your products in, in the internet. It enables people to actually configure the product and purchase them online and thus support sales and boost your sales figures. After you have defined where to start, um, you need to define your content model and re-engineer your content so that you break up your documentation documents and create smart content, modular content that is enriched with metadata. And of course, you need to define a content supply chain. Where is the source of truth? Where do you want to manage your content and in which other systems you want to use that content? Yes, we would be happy to support you. Uh, give us a call or uh, scan the QR code. Um, and if there are any questions, I will be here after the session and answer them. Thank you.